All right, Brother Bob. He's going to open the service and say a few words. Praise God, Bob Turner. Praise God. I'll call up the pastor later on. Come on. Out. Praise the Lord, we're coming to you live from Lori House, Multiplex Auditorium. Uh, here in Lori House, uh, we're Fort Island Sanctuary, our hosting these services this weekend. Hallelujah. And I'm glad most Lake are here in Easterville. All the visitors, maybe Cross Lake, are here already. So we're going to open the service. Praise the Lord. I'm Scott now. Do Temuk visitors. I'm Scott Tausik. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, give me a turn. Oh, Father, Lord in heaven, how would be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus Save me, amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm gonna sing a song. If you see your brother standing by the road With a heavy load With a CD show And if you see your sister falling by the way Just stop and say They are going on the wrong way you gotta try a little kindness So little kindness Sign your light for everyone to see And if you try a little kindness Then you'll get over the blindness of a narrow-minded people on the narrow-minded street. Don't walk around or down and out lending a helping hand instead of doubt. And the kind of that you sow every day will help someone along that way. He got a try little kindness. So little kindness. 
shiny light for everyone to see. And if you try a little kindness, then you'll get over the blind of an narrow minded people on the narrow minded streets. Yes. You know, I remember sometimes back home in Grand Rapids. I used to go to this brown building off the reserve there. Hmm. Praise the Lord. And uh, when I left, Somebody told me that big brown building burnt down. <laughs> and I said, who cares? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm talking about that pub. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's where I used to go. Thanks to Calvary. Today I went back to the place where I used to go. Today I saw the same old friends I knew before. And when they asked me what had happened, I tried to tell them. Thanks to Calvary, I don't come here any. And 
I would like to acknowledge the uh, Fort Island Sanctuary. Praise God, hallelujah. Clint Turner, I'm going to ask if I can say a few words. Clint Turner. Praise God, hallelujah. And then we're going to cross Lego Gahi. Then we're going to be running the service for a while, and then the other musicians will take over about an hour, an hour and a half, an hour maybe.
the Lord to be here this evening. Praise God. And welcome to all the visitors here. Praise God. I just came in from out of town. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Welcome to Norway House. Praise God. You are listening. Come to church. Praise God. Baby, take it. Come and hear the word of God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I just thank the Lord um, for today. And to see you, my late brother, Thomas Bradburn. Praise God. And we went this morning to view the body. And we were there for a while. My dad and my mom. Praise God. And let's thank the Lord, you know. His brother is a Gisagi hat. Mantua. He had to scout his wife. Praise God. And he's finished his work. Thank you, Jesus. And you know, Jesus is about to return. We have to be ready. Get ready. Thank you, Jesus. We have to be ready at all times. Praise God. And God will show. Praise the Lord. We're coming to you live again from Nora House. Um, multiplex Auditorium. We're having a youth awakening services. So I'm going to call up the young man here, Lance Saunders. He said to come and share a few words. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand. Praise the Lord. You know, I'm um, happy to be here tonight and really uh, looking forward to these services for a while now. And <clears throat> you know, the Lord um, has really blessed me kept me and um, you know, I'll share a testimony um, you know uh, before I came to the Lord I was um, I wasn't bound by any alcohol or drugs and you know I had a I wasn't uh, I wasn't troubled I wasn't going through anything and you know when I got saved I told my wife I I don't have like a testimony, like nothing that God didn't really touch me and bring me out from when I was down. And I was just, <clears throat> just a calling that I answered. And shortly after I got saved, um, I just did some routine blood work. And you know, the doctors told me that my, I was having problems with my kidneys and that uh, the function is high the number of protein that passes through, so they said the number should be two, and yours is at 115. So I was seeing different doctors. I got referred to an internal medicine doctor, and he said he doesn't know what it could be. Like all throughout these months, I've been doing blood work and, you know, everything else with that. And it didn't change. And then um, I got referred to a kidney specialist, which you have to, which you have to wait for. And uh, you know, one night in the service, uh, I went up for a prayer. You know, I just kept what I was going through between me and my wife, and you know, I went up for a prayer, and I didn't expect. Um, Miracle that happened. Like, um, this man of God laid his hands on my back and told me that my kidneys were healed. And I just I dropped to my knees and I started thanking him, giving him glory, and just just so grateful for that, you know. And and I believed it. I received it. I claimed that healing, and I claimed that my kidneys were functioning properly. 
and about a month later, I got to see the kidney doctor and did the blood work and everything else with that. And you know, he told me that my kidneys, there's nothing wrong with them. That my, I'm not passing as much protein as I was throughout the past half a year and my kidney functions down and you know, it's, 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 um, I didn't expect to be touched like that and to be healed like that and you know I thought I was going to have to do like lifestyle changes and <clears throat> you know it's I thank God for that and, um, you know we serve a, a good God a living God There's power in your tongue, you know, there's power in there. And I just thank God for all he's doing in my life and looking forward to what he's going to do in the future. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I had this dream about two months ago that uh, I was here in the auditorium exactly like this here and I had a guitar <laughs> you know and I, I woke up and I told my wife I said, yeah you know I sang a song I don't know what song that is but I sang it and you know when the popular river house of prayer was here doing a skit I thought that's when they would be but they had their stage here and the pulpit was over there so I thought that's that's not it God revealed to me that these services would happen and that I would be standing here. So uh, I'd like to sing a song, play guitar. Just uh, you know, I just recently started singing in church. It's been something that's been in my heart to do, and you know, I've been praying for the, um, the boldness to do it and to praise. Take complete control 
So I'm going to call up our pastor from Port Island. We said to come and share a little bit. Praise God. I hear so like uh, this gospel is uh, you can get safe anywhere. To be born again. He's not coming back for a building. Praise God. But he's coming back for a church like you and I. Praise God. Hallelujah. But we have to live in the truth. Amen. We have to speak the truth. Praise God, no matter who you are. I was a Catholic, but I let go. I'm not in any home. I'm a born again man. Hallelujah. And I want to serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How many got healed yesterday, last night? Amen. I got healed too. And I went to the hospital yesterday. But I couldn't see a doctor. There was an emergency. Life flight, one of them fractured their, cracked their uh, pelvis. An elder lady was rushed. So we just came and went to eat and came to the service. But I was standing there. <laughs> Holy Ghost, hallelujah. And that's what it's all about. It's, it's the Spirit of God as He will is all my And any time... You know, the Lord can touch you, even in a chair. And I don't know how many times the Lord has healed me in my life. You know, even back problems, you know, everything. Even one time I hit my hand in a, I was in a trap line. I was alone. I was riding my skid. All of a sudden, I didn't see, I didn't see this rock under the snow. But then it, this, this hand was right up. And I thought I wouldn't be able to work anymore. But I thank God he's a healer. Amen. I go said, never give up. Never, never doubt God and keep asking him. Keep knocking. Keep seeking the Lord. And that's what the word of God says. You know, don't give up. You know, when I first got saved because of alcohol, I didn't tell anybody. I had pain. Your liver is sad. I know it was my liver because I was drinking too much and I had pain, and when I drank, that's the only time that that pain would leave. But when I stopped drinking, I would feel it. And many that you see that are chronic alcoholics, many times, that's the only time they don't feel pain is when they drink. But I want to tell you, if you're listening out there, you don't have to. Jesus can heal you, amen. He can heal you. And why don't you come tonight, amen. You know, even there was a service in a tent. I was asking the Lord, Lord, I want you to heal me. You know, while, while a woman was singing a gospel song in the back, all of a sudden, the power of God hit me. You know, I don't know how many times God would heal my back. It's not on purpose that we get injured, but because of the things we do. And the first one that, his name was uh, Makai that came. The first time I got saved, you know, we didn't have anchors when we were young when I was helping my dad we had to tie up big rocks to hold the net and we had to take them probably across this this 60 pounds 70 pounds and we used to pull them into the boat and many times when when you work like that you you don't know how much how much weight and you stress yourself in the wind but you know that man of God was laying hands on me and he said I see rocks <laughs> Then I, re I didn't remember right away. What is he talking about rocks? Then I remembered. It's not about crack cocaine. <laughs> it's about those rocks I was lifting and it caused a, an injury. But you know, I got healed and, and another man I've gone, I was going to Sabotavia. Malcolm Onias. And 
as he was finishing preaching, come it there. You know, I didn't see that fire, but I know it was coming. And I was standing in the altar while he was praying. Eh? All right, just, when I was going there, I, I felt the fire coming and it hit my back instantly. It healed me. You know, this is real. It's so powerful, oh man. But you got to expect. You know, when you go to the welfare office, do you expect a check or get out? <laughs> and uh, even when you go in a restaurant, eh, you, you got to expect a meal when you're going there, unless you're kicked out. <laughs> but here, you expect a miracle. Expect, talk to the Lord. Eh? You know, I want to share another one. I couldn't straighten out my back. That wasn't long ago. My girls would, would tease me, Shrek. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't straighten my back. I came walking crooked. But you know, I just went in a room and said, Lord, I, I ask you to heal me. Then I felt the hand touch me. Instantly that pain. Shrek was gone. Hallelujah. Instantly. Hallelujah. <laughs> it is real. I don't know why, you know. You, why don't you come? <laughs> The first time, don't, don't, don't you hesitate. Eh? You know, one, one man in the Bible, Jesus was praying for him. And he said, what do you see? I see trees. <laughs> then he prayed for him again. Then he seen people. Come on, hallelujah. If it doesn't work, come again. Hallelujah. You know, don't give up. Don't give up. Hallelujah. Kind of eh? You know, a lot of people give up. But don't give up. You know, it can heal you instantly, even if you're listening. Eh? Another time, you know, I, I don't know which one it was. I was watching this program, Benny Hinn. And I was sitting there. Eh? All of a sudden, I felt the fire. And, I, and I, whatever I needed help was, was gone. You know, I expect, every, even when I come here, I expect the Lord. Even to heal people, deliver people. You know, do in agreement, in one accord, in one mind, when you come to a place like this, to keep praying, to, to keep believing, you know, the anointing, corporate anointing to operate. You know, we have to have the same mind. You know, if, if God's going to use somebody, you know, begin to pray for him. Even when they're singing, you know, pray for them. You know, God is a, is a powerful... It's a body of man that it's going to operate and function together. And the only way is to agree. You may be the foot. Come on. Hallelujah. You may be the ear. To hear God. Amen. And I believe there's a purpose. One man said when, when he cut my little toe. There was a difference when I walked it. Uh, I felt it. That's why you need every, every body. You may not be coming to our church, but when we come on, under this place, you know, it's a body beginning to join together. And I believe that puzzle is so powerful. You know, the blood of Jesus does not discriminate. Come on. When you see your brother that's saved, you know, encourage him. Because I believe in the blood and the things that the Bible talks about, communion, eh? Communion is a powerful thing, and when you realize what it really means, you know, the Bible tells us, examine yourself, examine your life. When you take that communion of the body that, that was broken, but also examine the brother that you have, which is in the body of Christ. You know, many of the, the bodies that are in, a, in the blood of Jesus. You got to recognize it. And if you don't recognize it, you're blind. You'll be a, a favorite dishon. This is the only one I like. <laughs> but God doesn't want that. He wants you to operate under his presence, under his word. Not to be parcel. Guys, but I believe in these days that we live in, the brother saying, the blindness. <laughs> Be kind to everybody, even the unsaved. I believe, you know, the Bible tells us, you know, why we aren't saved 
It's because of the goodness of the Lord that lead us to repentance. Without the goodness, we will never get saved. You know, that's how I got saved. You know, in, in a church, if they were mean to me, I wouldn't have went there. But that's how God changed my life. And that's why I kept going. Because somebody took time to pick me up when I didn't want to go to church. Because I felt I didn't belong in church. A lot of people that get saved still are going through struggles, battles in their minds. Sometimes the enemy will tell them, you're not good enough. You're not saved. What are you doing? But I want to tell you, don't let the devil condemn you. And allow the spirit to operate through you. Begin to resist the enemy and he'll flee from you. Eh? And I believe that the Bible says when, when we begin to have the fullness of Christ, the stature, the fullness. When Jesus came, he went to the sinner. He was a friend of the sinners, meaning he went there to, to minister to them. He went there, but he didn't join what they were doing, meaning no sin. Come on, hallelujah. He came out and souls came. <laughs> and I believe that's the same way. And many people that, that get saved, they, they, it's, all of a sudden you lose them because... They, they turn back to the world. That's why it says, hey, pray at least one hour a day that you will not fall into temptation. If we follow that, what Jesus said, hey, at least pray one hour. Then when temptation comes, Mogasai will see you and you will be able to resist it. No, I, I don't want that. I want to live for Jesus. Come on. And this one, what I want is uh, the young people, you know, you see these young people got saved and, in the summer when we put up a tent. I'm so amazed at how God begins to grow them. They didn't play guitar yet. But I thank God, you know, the fruit of God. It's so important, the, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of God. You know, that's the most important thing. As you live in this world, don't allow bitterness, hatred, strive. To block the blessing of God. And that's where one time a preacher preached. His name was uh, Hudson. Alec Hudson. Probably I was only about six months in the Lord. Man, did he ever preach that? You know, I believe in chapter on the second Peter. Man, he really explained it. If you add to your faith, virtue, all those things, eh, as you begin to grow... Temperance, you know, some of you still may have uh, temper tantrums and you get mad easy. But as you begin to act, temperance, because she bent them and say, not to argue, not to burst out with anger and you begin to grow, you know, the virtue. And when you begin to do this thing, you will never fall. How many believe that? It says in the word, Moga Pagasin. But if you don't, you know, if you don't walk in that, in that area, you're blind. You can't see afar off. But as you begin to grow, you can see ahead where God's taking you. The plan of God, as you begin to pray for souls, for your reserve. In your mind, we're supposed to be master builders. To build uh, the body of Christ. And that's why we're here. Setting up this, this service. That souls that never been healed. That never heard the word. Will get saved. Come on. Hallelujah. You're going to get God in, a go in that gospel net. And that net. You know when you sing. When you testify. You're part of this body. You're part of the net that, that they're coming into. And I believe it is, there's going to be a great harvest of souls. Even out there that are listening, eh? they want to come. They, they want to come home. They want to change. But something got a hold of them. Some of them are in adultery, fornication, leading a double life and selling drugs. It seems like the devil, you can never change. But tell the devil he's a liar, you can change. You can come home. 
Once you make up your mind, no devil, no, nobody can stop you. It's you. It's you. Kick out doubt. Knock it down. I want to say it. You know, you're losing everything when you're in the world. You're losing everything. But when you come back to the Lord, you're going to win. God's going to build you. God's going to restore what the locusts have eaten, what the enemy had destroyed. You know, begin to build. No matter what you're going through, maybe you're a Christian. The enemy's attacking you in every corner of your life. It seems like, what's going on? But I want to tell you, you're in a right track. Hallelujah. Amen. When an Askaman, the visitors that are here, Jude is here. Hallelujah. Kinos are here. Hallelujah. You know, they were small when we used to go to their hometown. And many of the, the brothers that are here, that are saved, even yesterday, that the funeral, the, the wake, that, you know, those boys were so small when, when Thomas had them. And now they're, they're really big, those boys. But I believe they're, they're going to serve the Lord. And it's the purpose to say, mentor them. You know, bring them in. There's a way out. You know, people are coming. You know, don't be afraid to share what God has done for you. Hallelujah. Ma, I welcome everybody. You know, just feel free. There are stuff that the ladies are doing in the back. You know, it's, it's about the gospel. It's about the work of God. And I'll listen to Jimmy Swagger. I just want to say this because in a ministry, there are things that you do in a ministry. God will give you wisdom how to do things. But not for self, like, like the world wants to be famous. But it's only individually. But when you do things for God, that's for the purpose of God. You know, the things that you do. And many times better that Jimmy Swigert sold a million copies of what God has given him. That's how you see the big ministry that God has given him. And these are the things that we have to have wisdom in. You know, the many of them ministers that are out, are out there or help each other. And many of them have jet planes because they believe in God. Bigger things. Not just a little bus, but a jet, a plane. For me, I believe, we'll, you know, these great men of God are going to travel by plane. If we agree together, see, it's, it's not a big thing, you know. A person to travel in a place, you know, a caravan, a been passenger it's not much. Half a million is not much. Did you know that? God is able to bring these up. Even his instruments. Yeah? The Bible tells us that the wealth that the wicked is laid up for you and I. And as we begin to believe, yeah, God's going to begin to pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive. I believe that because I've seen it. My woman encouraged me to go. We cheat. We cheat. Because some of you are facing turmoil. Because you're destroying something that the enemy has built. But when you destroy it, you know, through these years I've seen, but I, I don't give up. You know, when you see Lori House, the first place I want to build, not build, I want to put up a, uh, a tent. Do you know to put it? Vietnam. That's what they call this place over here. This probably before June, maybe one. Ten service, North End, uh, Mission Island, Panagus Point. How, how many thank God we have a vision? That's what you call a vision. To reach somebody that can come. Even gang members to get saved. Amen. And this is my desire. My son, you know, my daughters to get saved. To, to walk in the gospel. You know, I'm like this brother. It blesses me. His sons are playing guitar. Keep it up, young men. It's not a waste of time. The world is a waste of time. But what you're doing is precious. You know, God's going to build you. He's going to anoint you in a mighty way. I'm taking so much time. 
Hand it back to Brother Chris. Say good shit. That was our pastor, Stephen Robertson, from Port Island, Glory House Sanctuary. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, if there's, some, if there's anyone here with a shoulder, shoulder, shoulder plate on the right side, I felt it yesterday, I felt it. So I'm going to ask you to come and we'll pray for you. And I'll ask the pastors and all the people that are to pray for whoever it is. Praise God. I'm going to ask Flora to sing. Flora Turner. Praise God. Hallelujah. Is there anybody that has a, your shoulder plate is on your right side? Like you always say, oh. He's got chicken. Praise God. Hallelujah. The pastors, cor corporate anointing together. So we'll work together. Praise God. Hallelujah. Come on, what this case is. I love me that I said, you guys like to hear again. We need to get a sack. We need to be We're all clean, amen. We're clean by the blood of Jesus. Even if we stepped in here five minutes, we're still going to be, get paid the same. Hallelujah. We're going to be born again. Hallelujah. We're going to be, your name will be entered in the Lamb's book of life. In one second, if you call upon the name of the Lord. So sing a song, Lord. drive out uh, to places uh, in the summertime and um, we would go to tent services and um, I thank God for those years that we had that time to travel in Isnan and now that we're getting old thank you Jesus I thank him for everything but not really really old <laughs> I thank God for saving souls. Hallelujah, Jesus, that souls are coming. Yes, uh, I give him all the praise, all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And as uh, when my husband Ovenat was opening a service tonight, he was he was telling you that about that that hotel that burnt and uh, I used to have a hard time when he used to drink lots but I'm glad that Jesus saved him he saved him from alcohol he saved him from suicide thank you Jesus from everything that I had to go through when he used to come home when he would drink but Jesus saved him. Jesus made a difference in our family. My, my children used to get scared, and I would get scared, and he would drive us out of the house, and he would be drunk. He wouldn't remember the next day. And, but Jesus saved him. And I thank God for that. Thank you, Jesus. I give him all the praise, all the glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. There was this time that, that um, he was drunk and I was driving a boat for him. And he tied his motor onto that uh, the boat. And I was driving and he was drunk and I had to watch him. And that um, motor fell onto the water, but he tied it up there. And I had to bring that motor back to the boat. I managed to do that. And, I thank God that he was there all the time, that, that he looked after me, and he thank God for that. I praise the Lord on all the things, but Jesus saved him. I thank God for that. Hallelujah. And I thank him, Sanista. And my son is uh, playing lead here. Hallelujah. I thank God for him, my son, Clint, the older brother, that they're that they're saved. And I know the others are coming. Hallelujah, Jesus. All together, we had six boys and a girl. I thank 
thank God for them. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah.
the Lord a help. The Kavi Chihuahua the cross lake. Praise God, hallelujah, they're not far from here. Praise God. Sonson Karikaga, his wife. Praise the Lord, it's good to be here tonight again. My wife can't come up, she still have a sore ankle. Had had an accident last night. But I thank the Lord to be here again. Last night the word was good. We got to keep the word, listen to the word. And uh, when I was in uh, the trap line, I should say, that's where I met Stephen. That was about 12 years ago before I got saved or more. And he, uh, he preached to me there, me and my friend. There's only about four of us that he preached and tell me about this gospel. And it stuck in my mind, but my wife was saved already. But I kept going with her to church. But I was I was in uh, racing all the time in canoes. Probably twenty years of my life wasted there, I should say. Because uh, I used to be in a canoe three hours a day, every day, weekends, seven hours. But I was, to, to win, you got to train. But money didn't mean nothing now to me. I want our Lord Jesus Christ. It's more important than money, than everything else. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to do this, we're going to go there. God has a plan, each and every one of us. It's good to plan, but sometimes it doesn't work. I to Antipiscook, Pamuteuak, me and my wife, all over, Pam Pitiguak, or Escoisa, a Gaskita, the Pumpanitsiak. You know what the winner is, man, and the Pamana. Praise the Lord. But I thank everybody that's here Moose Lake, Grand Rapids, Easterville, and uh, Norios. You know, we like coming to Noria was every time I, uh, I, I usually don't dress like this, jeans and everything. My children always knew already, are you going to Noria house <laughs> with uh, my dress up? But I thank the Lord to be here, to hear the word again. With that, God bless. And, uh, I guess my wife's going to say something. Hello, hello. Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord to be here. Um, I thank him for his mercy and his saving grace. And ask him what he did in my life and what he's about to do. To come and join you. Thank you, Lord. Minayo, eminent man, help the people that came. Some faces I know, but a lot I don't. Thank you, Lord. 
Sí, se puede instalar y te dan más como el mantu. Cague en el guante. The Lord will bless you all in Jesus' name. Hello, good evening, praise the Lord. I'm so glad to be here again. How many times be here for the servant for the Lord? Amen. I got a long, long time ago for Steve. I got uh, maybe 42 years ago now. I'm going to tell you what I'm saying. 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 I'm going to tell you what I would also ask one and would I get sick back. Then when I get out and the sour nook, Monica would see now as bits a good old day with a good day in York. Cabbage is a good day and then make a young day out and a good day. Hallelujah, Jesus. I would also ask one and would I get sick. Minenteni mina 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 yao iki pe mi ti sa my pastor for George Gunner. He wants me to go over there to China and next 26 and 27, 28. I'm so glad about the the good chitan tai do tian. The Lord willing, I'll go. Aga manega skitan. Amen. I want to sing a song for the. Too many people go with us. Then I ask how much it is. Second song for our great award, Cree.
God bless you. We'll meet again. Amen. Praise Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. For Thomas Beardy, Johnston Carrick, you know. Pastor, we're going to take the evening offering. Uh, we'll call some more people after. Praise God. I was going to call uh, our rich Chinaman sitting to those people. But after, praise God. And uh, I'm going to call up the young people. We'll sing us two songs. We're going to take an offering tonight. And then after that, we're going to ask the Muslim to sing a few songs. Most like a Easterville to take over for a while. But I'll be here to conduct the service. Praise God to call up the, the preacher and I hope. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, Fort Island, young people, or if you're young, young people, if you're not from here, you can come. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you're safe, if you want to sing, praise God. Hallelujah. If not, I'll sing alone. <laughs> Maybe everybody's tired. Let's all stand. Please, God, uh, if you want to come, I'll give you young people. So uh, go around, greet one another. We're coming to you live from Glory House Auditorium. You're at the multiplex, praise God. We're also on Lori House, she JNC 97.9 FM. Read one another, hallelujah. When banks of death she stood back so on to the low I cried till Jesus came and they feel how stuck he did I would not be 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the people that gave and also the people that wanted to give, Lord. Bless everyone here today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I think Pastor wants to share something. Praise God. I'm going to call up the most league. Okay, just to give up the band. So we're going to have to go to, I use a, a word, we bet it's 9.30 or 10 o'clock. Praise God, hallelujah. So come on up, run. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand as we come. Tomorrow we're going to have more time, amen? Come early, 6 o'clock or 7. If you want to testify or dance. Bring your ukulele. Amen. That's Easterville. Amen. Sarah, come. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Those in East Town, ask them. Amen. 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 <clears throat> I'll sing one, amen, while, amen.
Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Amen. I was thinking on things, listening and throughout the, throughout the time, every young person I bump into, I try and invite them. Amen. To come and, <coughs> you know, but, you know, when the pastor mentioned about Ayawa, young people like I mean are serving the Lord you know we grew up I grew up in a, a pastor's home amen it doesn't shouldn't discourage you you know what Lance Lance you know, brother and then you know you know that testimony you know some some uh, I was uh, you know, some have testimonies concerning alcohol, drugs, and you know, but but you have a powerful testimony. Amen, amen. You can tell, you know, I have young people that you know they never tasted alcohol, never tried drugs, and serving the Lord. Eh? That's a testimony, you know, the Lord, what He's done for you. Amen. You're continuing. Amen. With the knees of that, you know, that uh, there's a, a minister I heard one time ministering on that, and you know, one of the young people got discouraged by um, 
all you've been hearing testimonies on alcohol and drugs, how they got, got all from our gangs. And, but to me, it, uh, um, it's not much in my life. Like I haven't gone through things. Amen. But you know the Lord, what He's doing in your life. You know, as I push come on these things, you know, as a teenager and, you know, peer pressure. Then, and that's a testimony, eh? You know, he's picking up the guitar and, you know, that's what, that's what we need to, my own, to encourage the young people. You know, these little ones running around and, amen. You know, the Lord is good, amen. Amen. And then now we drifted away from, you know, the Lord, you know, from teaching, the, the teachings that, you know, my parents had and, you know, we, we rebelled. Amen. But, you know, in the pastor's home, you know, and, you know, you know, the work that they've done, you know, it carries and you carry on and, amen. And I, I'm thankful that, you know, we're still holding on to it and, my children, we used to all, it was a big thing today that, um, you know, um, sitting in the back, that was one, one of the things that um, I, I got my sons to come sit in the front and, amen, you know, leave the back, the back area for the ones that, amen, that are starting out and coming up. Amen. Make room for them and Amen. Because the young ones coming in, they, they see the front seats empty and they don't want to sit in the front. They want to go somewhere and just want to listen. Amen. But I've seen it happen. Amen. Amen. But I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, believers, you know, you know, if you can, you know, move up to the front and Amen. The ones that are coming in, you know, they, amen. It will be appreciated. Amen. 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 But you know, I'm going to thank the Lord by a one. Seek Lord. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
so thankful. Amen. And then as you know, my, my grandchild, I know my eczema was so bad. Just uh, a few weeks, at any a few days, and it was so bad that when my, my daughter brought Hayawa, uh, Zephaniah, when he brought him up, uh, not even one years old, when he brought him up, you know that doubt came so strong. I felt you know, unworthy even to even to pray. That's how bad it was, and and his lips were swelling so bad that uh, the eczema was getting worse. And I and I couldn't even hey, and I remember what my dad said as a parent. So my daughter was there and I remember that oil. I took oil and I said, My daughter and I think it's time Kina tip on the this is your your baby. Tumin tumin with oil. And she took the oil. And what she did was she she couldn't even say anything with, with tears, hugged my grandchild and she began to cry. Amen. And my my grandchild recovering, the swelling went down. Amen. And I know that, you know, eczema. Amen. I've seen a young man when we went hunting on a hot summer night. Eczema. He got up, he got up and he started to itch. And he began to itch even more to the point you can hear that, you know that. Almost all night. And I believe, you know, if you have anything, you know, the, you know the Lord will heal you. Amen. All I heard tonight was about healing. Amen. And I believe that there's people here that are going through things. Amen. The Lord's going to heal you. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. If you have worries at home, amen. I want to speak directly to the saints. Amen. Amen. Cameron. Amen. The Lord Dewapat Nigwek. Amen. In that accident, Danny. Amen. Through prayer. Amen. The Lord telling you the enemy tried. Amen. But the Lord's even greater. Amen. Just stay there. Amen. Stay with him, amen. And amen. He's been so good to us, amen. Amen. And the man, I want to give the sister Easter Louise the wall to sing, amen. Amen. I was kind of hoping I had a sister Turner, amen. I didn't want you guys to go down. Amen. Amen. As a lot of musicians. Amen. Oral. Amen. You should have stuck around. Amen. Just come up. Amen. If you feel like. Amen. That's where things begin to happen. Amen. 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 Come on, Sarah. For a drive, you know, to fellowship. You know, um, just praise God, you know, for what He's done, you know, what He's doing in our lives and your life. You know, not to give up because, you know, your redemption draws nigh. You know, Jesus Christ is coming back. So don't get tired, don't get weary. Just look up for your redemption draws nigh. I just want to worship the Lord with a song tonight.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. It's a blessing to see a lot of people here to come hear the word of God, that it'll help us all. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I encourage you, I encourage you all to keep praying for your loved ones, the people you meet. Let your light shine. Praise the Lord wherever you are, wherever you go. Be a blessing to everybody you meet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glorify the Lord every, every day. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you ready to go to heaven when the Lord comes? Are you ready? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am. Praise the Lord. A country where no twilight shadows deepen. An ending day where night will never be. A city where storm clouds cannot gather. For this is just what heaven means to me. What joy to be when we get over yonder and join the throng around the crystal sea to greet our loved ones and crown Christ forever. Now this is just what heaven means to me. And from all enmity and strife for free. No one kind words to wound the heart are spoken. For this is just what heaven means to me. What of Jesus before whose image other loves all flee and when they crown him Lord of all I'll be there for this is just what heaven means to me what joy
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Are we ready to meet the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's a blessed time that's coming, coming soon. It may be evening, morning, or afternoon. The wedding of the bride united with the groom. We shall see the King when he comes. Sing it with me, baby. Bless you. 
And one more thing I wanted to add. Last night, I got my healing. Amen. Hallelujah. My ear is healed. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, well, it takes a man to admit that he's wrong. Amen. How many men do we have? Stand up. Nobody? You're all right? Righteous? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. It takes a man to admit that he's wrong and say, Jesus, here I am. Praise God. Hallelujah. We were all wrong. Amen. How many can lift up their hands? Even women, we were all wrong. Praise God. And that's why we ask Jesus in our lives. He forgives us. Praise God. So at this time, I'm going to call up the minister, Chris. I don't know his last name. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Give the Lord a hand as he comes. He's going to minister the word of God. And we thank the Lord that he came this way. This is the first time I've seen him. He asked me, what's your name? I said, Chris. And what's your name? Chris. <laughs> so give the Lord a hand again. Praise the Lord. How is everybody tonight? I'm all right. I don't know about you. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's good to be here tonight in the house of the Lord. You know, I, everywhere I travel, I thank God that he's, he's with us, that he goes before us. Amen. That he sends us. You know, I was just uh, thanking the Lord tonight for, for all the testimonies of worship. You know, today we, uh, we, we were at the room and we were able to seek the Lord. And, you know, I went out for a drive this evening and we... We're praying all over Norway House, and you know Norway House is very blessed by the Lord. Amen. Uh, me myself, uh, my reserve is Pipe Out First Nation, and uh, I'm a Plains Cree. I don't speak Cree because I was born in the 70s, the 60s. They speak Cree. No, just kidding. I never, I never, never took the time to learn Cree. Uh, my name is uh, Christopher Westerquate, um, and I asked my dad one day, how come he named me Christopher? Because my dad named me. You know, as uh, fathers, we we pick our names for our children. And I asked my dad, why did you name me Christopher? He said, because Christopher means Christ within. I said, well, praise the Lord. And I was happy because, you know, the Bible says God gives us a new name. And uh, I, I thought, well, that's a good name, Christ within, Christopher. But, you know, uh, I called him back a couple hours later. I said, well, what does Westerquake mean? And he said, phone your Muslim, he'll tell you. So I phoned my Muslim. I said, Muslim, what does uh, Westerquake mean? Wasiquate, shiny skin or, or shiny face. It's a Cree name, Wasikwe, shiny skin, shiny face. So my name is Christ within, shiny face, or else Christ within, shiny skin. Amen? The Bible says in Mark, uh, in Numbers 6, 24, may the Lord's face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. Amen? So the Lord shines upon me. Amen? The Bible says we're changed into that image from glory to glory. Hallelujah. So I know my new name. Amen? Christ within, shiny skin. Hallelujah. That's how you say Wasikwe. You know, uh, uh, the girls used to tease us, call us, uh, was he cute? But praise the Lord. I thank God. To, I have a sister that came with us from uh, Regina, Saskatchewan. As I, I, met, I shared last night that uh, a lot of the people at Regina, uh, when God called me into the ministry, I, I, I didn't, uh, I went out and I, I did what the Bible said, to go into to the highways and the byways. And, you know, in Regina, we have, uh, you know, the gang members, it's the, the North Central, they call it the hood. It's the, the poorest part of Regina, and that's where all the First Nations are put. You know, and I grew up in the hood. I'm a, I grew up, uh, people call me a hood rat, just kidding, but I grew up in the hood, the hardest place of Regina, and that's where God put our church. Uh, God gave me a church 12 years ago. I'm a pastor 12 years, right in the heart of North Central. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of our church family uh, is from the streets. Uh, I, I have a lot of family. If you come to the house of Regina, I have an actual church there that's been there 12 years. Uh, uh, we have a congregation there of uh, probably 35 or 50 if they show up. But you know, a lot of the people that are there uh, never came from other churches. We, we, we found them in the highways and the byways. You know, a lot of prostitutes that got saved. A lot of prostitutes that had HIV and AIDS. Uh, you know, God healed them. 
God healed people, even the, the prostitutes. You come to our church, you would never know who the prostitutes are because the Lord healed them, delivered them, set them free. When they came in the house of God, they were about 95 pounds, 110 pounds. Today, they're a little over 200 pounds. They're healthy. God blessed them. They're married. They have children. You know, God, God changes people's lives. How many know that? That, that, that when we come to him, he makes something out of nothing. Come on. Hallelujah. And I have, I have a sister tonight that I wanted to come really quickly. Uh, uh, sister Sherry, I don't know if she's up here. Uh, Sherry Dubois, would you come? She's actually, a, I found out she was my, my relative. She's a, probably a third or a fourth cousin. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I found out later down the road through the bloodline I was related to her because her reservation is Pasco First Nation. That's two reserves over from my reserve. But I'm going to come quickly, give her maybe a 10, 15 minutes. Uh, uh, she has a testimony tonight. Uh, before we get into the word, I wanted to give her a few moments to, to just to give you guys a testimony of one of the, the family members uh, from the house of God. Uh, she's a born-again believer, uh, filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, she would join the church three years ago. I have another lady at the back, Eartha, would you give us a wave? Another elderly lady at the back named Eartha, uh, also her too. She, she, she came by the church in Regina, and, and, and you know, she was uh, going through a hard time, and uh, maybe someday she'll share her testimony, but uh, she's with us as well. Um, she gave her life to the Lord, and she walked by the church one day, and, you know, she heard the gospel music, and she came in. She gave her life to the Lord, and, you know, about a couple days later, her sister Mary came in and heard the music and gave her life to the Lord, and they both met each other a week later and said, come to my new church. Praise the Lord. They both came to the house of God, and they were surprised. And, this is my church. No, it's my church, but... You know, as God, God, God brought them together, and, uh, and you know, Sister Mary was with us about five years before the Lord took her home, her, her sister, older sister Mary. But you know, there's so much uh, uh, things that God is doing, amen, and I, I thank God for the house of the Lord, amen, I thank God for churches, amen, that the church can bring us and usher us into the presence of the Lord. So I'm going to ask Sister Sherry to give us uh, about 15 minutes of testimony that I want to get into the Word. Tonight, I want to encourage you, uh, stick around for a healing. Tonight, God wants to heal you. I know there's people that are having pain in the arm right now, your left arm. Please don't go. I want to pray for you. I see God restoring some muscles in the heart, whoever that person is. Uh, you know, I was, I was sitting here praying. I, I saw this big giant angel walk in. You know, uh, 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 when he walked in, you know, he left a bunch, a pile of kidneys. I saw a bunch of pile of kidneys. And I said, what are all these kidneys doing in the pile? And the Lord said, I'm bringing these kidneys to my children in this place. God wants to heal your kidneys. I've seen a lot of kidneys, so I, 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 I'm not making this up. I saw these kidneys. And I said, why did this angel leave all these pile of kidneys? The Lord said, these are for my children. Those of you that are having kidney problem, God's going to heal you. God wants to touch you. Come on, hallelujah. I want to encourage you. I know it's youth services, but God can still heal you right where you are. Even through the word of God being preaching, uh, God could heal you. And I, I was down in a service in Alberta, and I was preaching, and there was this lady wrapped up in a blanket, and it was cold that night, and, and the Lord said, tell that lady to rise up and walk to me. You know, as I was preaching, I stopped. I said, sister, Come up to the front. I want to pray for you. And she looked at her grandson and said, Tell him I am crippled. I cannot walk. And I said, Well, the Lord said to walk up here right now. And she looked at me and said, Okay, if that's God, I'll get up and walk. And she got out of that blanket and everyone looked at her and she stood up and she walked to the front. And then revival broke out because that lady was crippled for two years. She believed the word of God and she received her healing. So I encourage you tonight with the word tonight. Get ready because your healing is right there. If you get the message, you get the healing. Come on. How many know that the Bible says by his stripes we're healed? Either you're going to receive that or you're not. If you receive it, you're healed. If you don't receive it, you're going to stay the same. It's so simple. Come on. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I, I want Sherry to give us a part of her, tes her testimony a bit here. I, I, wanted, I wanted to share her testimony today because I know it's youth meetings and there's youth that are, are listening 
and maybe a mother or father of a youth is listening. How many know that the adults too, the, the, the parents need encouragement? Come on, hallelujah. Because a lot of times we go into doubt. Come on, we look at our children and, and we see, amen, that it's not getting better. It might get worse. They're partying more. They're, they're going to jail. They're going here. They're doing this. And sometimes we lose faith in God. Come on, hallelujah. That's why I like that when it's for youth because mom and dad will get encouraged. Hallelujah. You know, I have my son with me tonight. I'm not going to call him up, my baby boy. Uh, you know, he'd be 24 this year. He's single. He's not getting married till he's 40. But, you know, uh, he's with me tonight. Uh, you know, at a younger age, at the age of 12, 11, 12, he was addicted to a game called uh, uh, where they, uh, uh, Grand Theft Auto, I think it was, uh, the PS3. He was so addicted to that. And, you know, I, 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 he wouldn't have a relationship with me. He'd go to his bedroom after school, and you'll stay there till 10 o'clock. 11 and I finally knock on the door he had a key for the door you know and, and I'd send him to bed and you know I used to get angry as a father I didn't want him hooked to those games and, and I, I, he used to go to school and he'd lock his door and I, every I used to get mad I wanted to pull my belt off and whip him <laughs> but the Lord said no go pray in his room and I'll deliver him from these games for three weeks, I climbed in the window, and I jumped in his bed, and I, I knelt down on the side of his bed, and I started to pray in the Holy Spirit. For three weeks, I jumped back out the window and closed the window, and he never knew I was in his bedroom. And my wife used to say, why do you keep doing I said, because God said he will deliver him if I go and pray in his room. Well, after three weeks, my son came to my room. It was a Saturday night, about 3 in the morning. He knocked on my door, and he was weeping and crying. And he gave me his PS3. He said, Dad, I had this dream. And in this dream, I was running down the block, and these zombies came, and they were stabbing me. And then they turned to you, and they started to kill you. And then I woke up. I don't want to play these games no more. I said, Hallelujah. And he put his machine down. He walked out the bedroom door. Two days later, he said, Dad, can I take your guitar? I said, Sure. You know, two weeks later, I was doing laundry. I can hear him strumming and singing. You know, and I, I didn't know who's teaching him guitar now. And one day, I, I opened the door and I said, what are you doing, Elijah? He said, I'm learning to play guitar. I said, who's teaching you? He said, YouTube. You know, about three weeks later, he was playing Johnny Curtis, Jim Felix, all by himself. I was like, wow. Little did I know God gave him a gift for music. He could play uh, guitar. He plays lead. But right now he doesn't sing because he's shy, but we hear him in the bedroom at times. So I want to encourage you, uh, uh, mom and dad, if your children are addicted to social media, if they're addicted to video games, you still have power in the name of Jesus to break that off your children. Don't give up praying for your children because God can set them free. Come on, hallelujah. Come on, church. Uh, they can deliver them tablets. Come on. He can de deliver them. Come on, hallelujah. <laughs> well, get Sherry to come. Sister Sherry. in the name of Jesus. Uh, thank you for inviting us out here today. Um, it's always a pleasure and exciting to travel for the Lord. I, I enjoy it so much. Um, my name is Sherry Dubois. I'm from Pasco First Nation. I, uh, you want here? Uh, a bit nervous. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Um, so for six years of my life, I was addicted to crystal meth. Crystal meth had a hold on me for six years, and um, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you know, that's real. That, that, that spiritual warfare is real, and that's what made coming to the Lord um, so real for me because, you know, I sat with those, with those demons. Uh, you know, in Ephesians, one of the, the scriptures that the Lord gave to me when I first came was Ephesians 6.10 that, you know, that we, we wrestle against principalities. You know, we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places, you know, and, and, and I thank the Lord for that scripture because coming out of a, a addiction of crystal meth, that's real. You know, though that torment, those demons, you know, I, 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 I couldn't quit. You know, I would try to quit and I, and I couldn't do it. I was, I was just ready to give up. You know, I was hopeless. I was losing everything. I used to be a carpenter and I started, you know, selling my tools, selling everything I had because... I needed that drug, that's how I, I functioned. You know, I, I come from a cultural background. I never knew about Jesus Christ. I never knew about this Bible. You know, I thought this Bible was evil because of 
the residential school system. I thought, you know, that what it did to my parents, I, I, I tied them together, and, but I didn't know, you know the power that this Bible has, you know, and, and, and the, Lord, the Lord led me to uh, Pastor Chris's church, <laughs> and I would go and, you know, I would sit there and, and I would just cry, I would sit there and cry, and I would see these people dancing and just happy, and I wanted that, you know, and I would leave. Before prayer, I would always get up and leave, and I would drive back to my reserve, and you know, I was struggling, and I would come back to church. I'd drive an hour to church, and I'd sit there, and I'd cry around, and, and I didn't know what it was, you know, and, and growing up, you know, I was taught, you don't cry, <laughs> you know, you be tough, you be solid, suck it up, don't cry, you know, so growing up, I, I always try to be strong. I try to be that strong person, and I held everything in so I would come to church and I would just cry and you know I was going there for a few about a month and you know it was, <laughs> there's this they're doing prayer, the altar call and I went up and I do I don't even know what happened I was just slain in the spirit I fell down on the ground and I had this really intense deliverance you know, and the, 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 the church there were just praying over me. And, and I just wanted to run out of there because I didn't know what was going on. I was just screaming, pulling my hair out. And, you know, and then all of a sudden I felt this, this break in my stomach. And I felt free <laughs> for the first time in my life. I felt so free and I felt the power of God. I felt the Holy Spirit, you know, and, and that feeling of peace. You know, it was like the, the world lit up, like it was bright, and I had hope, and I had purpose. You know, I drove back home to my reserve, and I cried, but for the first time, it, was, it wasn't crying and feeling sorry for myself. It was crying happiness. I've never experienced that. I went to my mom, <laughs> and I was like, I'm crying, but I don't know why. I'm so happy. And, you know, and, and we, we, it's the love of God, <laughs> you know. And I just thank the Lord from that day forward. You know, I kept pressing in. I kept coming to church with Pastor Chris and, and, and the church family. And, you know, during my addiction, <laughs> um, I had cancer. And uh, part of the drugs, you know, when you do meth, it, it numbs that feeling. So, you know, I didn't get dealt I didn't go to the doctor I didn't go I didn't care I just I wanted to die because I felt hopeless right and so I had this cancer and, and when I after that deliverance you know I started thinking what about my sons you know what am I going to do with my sons who's going to look after my kids and you know and because I was I was in pain and you know and Pastor Chris he's like <laughs> thank the Lord for him hallelujah he gave me the scriptures of healing I didn't know there was healing scriptures in this Bible you know praise God he gave me, he gave me the scriptures and I studied them and I stood on them you know in Isaiah 53 it says you know but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities you know the chastisement of our peace was upon him <laughs> and by his stripes we're healed. You know, I stood on that scripture. I would say it every day. And I believed. I really believed. You know, and as I kept coming to church, people kept coming in and they were telling their testimonies about what the Lord did for them. And they would talk about how the Lord delivered them and healed them. You know, and that gave me hope. You know, maybe I don't have to die from this cancer. You know, and so I went and I, I started going to the doctors. And, you know, the doctor said, you know, <laughs> going to take a few surgeries it's going to take a few surgeries and hopefully we can get get you know take care of you and you waited so long to come in and you know and I still stood on those words that you know my pastor that pray with me I came up for altar call and you know I really accepted the Lord was going to heal me in my mind I accepted it by that my faith you know and I went for that first surgery and I went and I had this little Bible and I, and I held on to this Bible while I went for surgery. And when I went under, I sat with Jesus under this big apple tree. <laughs> it was so beautiful. I sat at his feet on this hill on the apple tree. And I was just laughing, looking up at him, laughing. 
when I, when I woke up from my surgery, I was laughing and the nurses are, this one came too and she's laughing, or, are you okay? And I said, yes, I dreamt of Jesus, praise God, I said, and I knew right then I was, I, that I was healed. <laughs> you know, and a, a few weeks passed and the doctors called and I said, you know, it's a miracle. It's all gone, there's nothing there, you don't have no cancer share, you know, and I just right away, praise God, <laughs> you know, he's a healer. You know, and I just, for the past three years now, I've been, you know, learning this word because I never grew up with this word. Nobody taught me this word. You know, I came from a cultural background that, that hated this book. <laughs> but you know, this book is powerful. There's power in this book. So I just want to encourage you, you know, if, if you have kids out there that are on drugs or if you're on drugs and you're struggling and there's power, you keep coming to this altar and you get in a church and you stay planted and you get under a praying co congregation, a Holy Ghost filled church. That's where we need to be. That's where we're going to get our healing and our deliverance. You know, that's where signs and miracles and wonders happen. You know, I'm so blessed this past two Two years I've been traveling with my, my um, church family and I've seen so many miracles and it's, it's such a beautiful thing, you know, and I just thank the Lord, you know, that, um, <laughs> that he is a live God. <laughs> you know, my whole life he was a dead God, you know, idols and whatnot I worship, but, you know, to serve a live God is such a beautiful thing. You know, when I had that deliverance, I was still, I was still smoking cigarettes, but I would come to church and, you know, people were talking about their testimonies about being set free from smoking and, you know, that gave me hope. You know, I didn't want to smoke. I smoked for 20 years of my life. Every day I had a cigarette, but, you know, I went to that altar. I made up my mind. We got to make up our mind and then the Lord will do the rest of the, the rest of the work. I came up to the altar and I got prayer and I threw my smokes on the ground and I said, I want to be set free. You know, and they prayed for me and I felt this chain break off from me. It was literally like a, a snap in my stomach. And again, I felt that freedom again. I was completely free. Praise God. You know, he's, he's that good. You know, I walked away and I didn't even crave a cigarette, you know, from 20 years of being a smoker. No Nicorette, no nothing. It's Jesus that does it. It's not me. I couldn't do it in my own will, but through God I was able to. You know, I just thank the Lord that I'm able to travel and, and encourage other people. You know, when... <sighs> thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for setting me free, Lord. Oh, he's so good. He's so good. Don't give up. Don't stop praying. You know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lead not on your own understanding. You know, we can do all things through Christ. <laughs> he gives us strength. You know, I used to never be able to talk in front of people. You know, I was so scared. I would stutter my words. Being on crystal meth, my mind was cooked. It was gone. I couldn't talk. You know, and that was one thing that was frustrating for me is because I couldn't have a conversation. I would do things like that didn't make sense. You know, but the Lord healed my mind, not only my body, but my mind. <laughs> he gave me my, my life back. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You know, I, 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 was just, I was in prayer this morning and I was thinking about you know, before I was saved and, and <laughs> the crazy stuff I was into, you know, I was with, um, I was with, uh, in that gang life, I was, and I was in a very abusive relationship, you know, he used to beat me, he almost, I would wake up and I'd be being strangled for no reason, you know, and I just thank, <laughs> thank the Lord, you know, that before I was even conceived, the Lord already put me, I was already, he formed me before I was even in my mother's womb. He, I was already chosen. I was already put there, you know. And the Lord bring that to my, to my, my, my thoughts today. And I was so grateful. In Jeremiah one five, I'll read it. I don't want to misquote it because it was so powerful. You know, even though I wasn't serving the Lord or I didn't know the Lord, He still kept me my whole life. You know, He kept me. There was times where I should have been dead. 
in accidents and driving off overpasses, but the Lord kept me. <laughs> and Jeremiah 5, 1, or 1, 5, it says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. You know, and I went today and I googled, well, what's prophet? <laughs> like, what is that? Like, you know, what? we're all prophets. We're all meant to bring the word of God forward. We're supposed to be that light in this in this dark world. We're supposed to be out there and and <clears throat> giving people that good news. You know, staying staying in the word, reading our word daily, praying, seeking the Lord's face, you know, and as, as we clean out our vessels, the Lord will use us, you know, and I desire that now, and I'm so grateful that the Lord chose me, and the Lord chose all of you, you know, I just want you to know that if you're going through anything, the Lord, <laughs> the Lord already brought you through in Jesus' mighty name, <laughs> you're already won, you're on the winning side. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You're so good, Lord. I just love you, Lord. Jesus, praise you, Lord. You're so good, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. You know, I used to be a carpenter. <laughs> and the other thing the Lord did for me, you know, to glorify him was he blessed my hands to create merchandise, to create t-shirts and, and bags and with his word on it <laughs> you know that's meaningful when i make when i make clothing with the words of god on it that's like it's like a light going out into the world you know and and, and that's that's part of my testimony is the lord has blessed me to be able to make stuff that glorifies him you know and i and it's such a blessing you know that's how i i look after my children and that's how i'm able to travel with the ministry is you know doing this merchandise and and i'd like to i know there's so much youth here i i have some stuff i want to give the youth <laughs> um some bags and some shirts that i want to give to them you know and it's it's for the glory of god you know when we're wearing something that says jesus on it it's a light we need to be that light in the world and you know i thank the lord i don't i'm not a carpenter you know i i do what <laughs> brings light to the, to the Lord, and I just love him so much. And I thank you guys for inviting us to your community. It's such a beautiful community. We drove around today, and you guys are so blessed. You're so blessed to have a church. <laughs> you know, I was never grew up around a church. You know, we need that. We need to have the word of God. We need to be fed. We need to be under a pastor who who really loves us and prays for us and you know i thank the lord for my pastor and my church family i thank the lord for them because they're my strength you know and they that's love that's the love of god and i look forward to the word of god tonight and i hope this encouraged you don't give up call on jesus read your bible you know the lord will speak to you through this word he'll speak to you and he'll speak to you in a way that's very meaningful to just you just you <laughs> it's a live word this bible is a live word it's a living word of god i hope that encouraged you guys god bless Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord for Sister Sherry's testimony. You know, back in Regina, we have a lot of young people her age that are, have similar stories to what the Lord has done for them. Uh, as she said, she's glad, uh, she's blessed to be in Nori House. You know, I'm an urban Indian. I grew up in the city. My reserve is Pipod. I was, I, I didn't really grow up much years on Pipods, but my mom was from Kerry the Kettle. So I was, I kind of grew up on Care to Kettle at a young age. Uh, my, my, uh, I'm going to share my testimony tonight. Uh, I know a lot of, uh, I know I, uh, I, um, I was seeking the Lord today and, you know, I was going to say, wait till tomorrow night and share my testimony. But when I walked into place tonight, the Lord said, 
give your testimony. But I wanted to preach. I love preaching. When you study the Word of God and you dissect the Word of God, you know, it's, it, it gets so awesome to, to know the hidden things of God and you want to share it. I had, I had, I had a, a word tonight, but when I came in, the Lord said in a clear voice, share your testimony. About, 10 min, about 15 minutes of sitting down and Pastor Steve came and said, Brother, share your testimony tonight. I said, sure. <laughs> so, you know, that's how the Lord works, you know. But I, I thank God tonight, amen, that, uh, that, that we're here. And I'm glad that all the surrounding communities of uh, Moose Lake, we've been to Moose Lake the time of COVID. Uh, Sister uh, Marlene invited us down there. We had some services and healing services. You know, uh, we, uh, you know, I heard that Easterville's here. I've never been to Easterville, but I know Sister Sarah and her husband. And then uh, from, from there, and you know, I also, uh, uh, I think they said Cross Lake is here. I've never been to Cross Lake. Oh, I've been to Cross Lake. I've been there when I was about 12 years old. I've, I've been there once, uh, to Cross Lake once when I was 12 years old. I don't remember much of it because I was only 12. My Uncle Haas took me there when I was 12 years old. So I only drove by there a few times now, but I've been to Cross Lake once. <laughs> but you know, I want to I encourage you tonight. I, I said, that could take too long. I have my son timing me 40 minutes. I try to give you guys time, 40 minutes, because I know it, it's very long. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the study shows that a human being can only take 40 minutes, and then their mind shuts off. So I'm going to be fresh with you tonight, 40 minutes. Praise God. But, uh, you know, I just want to share my testimony. You know, I, I was born and raised in a Christian home. Uh, we lived in Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, my dad is uh, Clifford, West Dakota, and my mom, Sherilyn Jack. You know, uh, I grew, grew up under their ministry. You know, my mom and dad uh, had, a, had, a, had a church in Regina. You know, they, uh, one of the founders of Miracle Center, Van Johnson's church, before that came about, my dad was brought him t- from Ontario to Saskatchewan. You know, my mom and dad had a ministry. You know, we had a lot of ministers uh, coming through Regina. My mom and dad were very well-known pastors. My dad traveled through Canada and some of the United States. You know, my mom and dad were soul winners. You know, I grew up with five of us uh, in our house, uh, five siblings. I have an older brother and sister and two, two younger sisters. I'm the middle child. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian home. I, I never was uh, raised uh, any other way but the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, and uh, growing up at a, at a young age and going to church all the time with my mom and dad, you know, it, it was a blessing uh, to, to, to live that lifestyle. But at the age of seven years old... Um, my mom and dad, they, 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 uh, uh, my dad, my dad uh, made mistakes in the ministry. Uh, he failed the marriage, and he, he, he ran off on my mom. And, uh, you know, uh, a year later, they got back together, and, 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 and they started to drink. So we saw a lot of alcohol in the home. Uh, you know, I saw my, my dad beat up my mom, and my mom beat up my dad. You know, uh, uh, at the age of seven years old, my grandparents were born-again Christians, and they came in from the reserve and they took me and my, my sisters and brothers. While my mom and dad were out partying, my, 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 my grandparents came in and took us kids, stole us, and took us back to Carity Kettle. Uh, you know, about uh, two months later, my mom came out there drunk and she grabbed my, my younger siblings. By the time I got to the window, somebody grabbed me and my mom pulled away. You know, but I, I, I grew up on a reservation without a mom and dad. You know, it was very heartbreaking for me because I was so used to having mom and dad and going to church after seeing alcohol abuse and being taken to a reserve, you know, it was very different, you know, to live out there. You know, as a young age, uh, eight and nine, I used to always uh, wish and hope my mom and dad would pull up down the gravel road and say, come on, son, we're, we're Christians again and we're, we're preaching again, come home. But it never happened like that for me. I came out of a broken home. Uh, you know, at the, at the age of, uh, I was uh, 10 years old, and, you know, we, we, we were playing at a barn, and, and me and my three cousins, and, you know, these five men, you know, they, they raped us in a barn for hours in our butts. So I had sexual abuse in the barn. You know, I, I, I carried that with me, you know, uh, being sexually abused, being raped in my behind. You know, I, I didn't feel very well as a young man after coming out of a Christian home and, you know, uh, being... St- stolen from my mom and dad and then being raped as a young boy and you know at the age of uh, 
12 and 13, I would go to church because when I'd go to church, all the pain in my heart would, would vanish. Being a little, being a, being in the presence of God would, would take that hurt, that abuse. Being in the, being in the gospel service is it? I didn't want the church to be over because I felt good. But when church went over, I'd go home and I'd feel the pain of sexual abuse and rejection and abandonment. As I lived on a reserve, I, I never had a birthday. My grandparents, they didn't know that my birthday. I never, never had anything new. I'll hand, hand me downs. And I, I'm not saying this to be pitiful, but that's just kind of what I went through in my life. And at the age of 12, I, I met a man of God that told me that I must be born again. Ricardo Beza came out to a gospel service on Carity Cuddle and Sunday after, Saturday afternoon, we were, we were with my cousins and we went to my uncle's house and we broke in his truck and we stole his cigarettes. And I was uh, about 12 years old and, and we took my uncle's smokes and we're, we're walking by the tent. We're looking for matches. So my cousin took the smokes, a half a pack of smokes and he put it in his sock. And we knew at the tent they burned the mosquito coils and we're going to go there and we're going to go light a cigarette that afternoon and have our first smoke. But when we got to the tent, the skirts were all up all around and there was this man, six feet, six feet, six feet, six foot five, wearing a, a nice brand new blue suit and it, it was empty in the, in, the, in the tent and he sat on a chair at the front all alone. And, our, our, and we saw the matches beside the speakers and we're trying to sneak in while he was, he was just sitting in front on a chair and all he was doing was praying in the Holy Ghost. And when we came under the tent, you could, you could feel the presence of God and there was nobody playing music. It was just him all alone and the matches for the coils were sitting there. So we're coming to grab these matches because he had his eyes closed and there was sweat and tears pouring down his, his face and we thought we'll just sneak in while he's praying. And when we got close to the matches, he looked at us. He said, come here, you boys. And there was four of us, you know, and he, he, he got off that chair and he told my one cousin, come here. And he took, the, uh, took a chair and he said, come here, young man. He'll put your leg right here. And my cousin was looking at him. He put his leg there and he told my cousin, pull up your sweats and let me see what's in your sock. You know, and... My cousin looked at him and he, he looked at him and he pulled up his sweats and he pulled his sock down and that's where the smokes were and he, he looked at him and said, these will kill you, these will kill you. To our amazement, you know, that opened my eyes. I, I looked at him and then, you know, he looked at me and he just, he looked at me and he said, young man, God has called you. God has chosen you. God's going to use you. You know, and he said, come here, you need to be born again. I said, what do you mean I need to be born again? He said, God wants to adopt you. John 1, 12, many that received him to them gave me power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Do you want Jesus Christ to give you the new birth? Do you, do you want him to baptize you today and fill you with the Holy Ghost? I said, yeah, I, I'd love that, sure. I didn't know what I signed up for that afternoon, but he said, well, raise your hands. I lifted my hands and I closed my eyes and he said, repeat after me. And he just said, Holy Spirit, I give you permission in the name of Jesus Christ to, to baptize me, to fill me with the evidence of praying in tongues. And I just remember saying that and, you know, like, just like that, just like a wind came in that tent and I don't know what happened, but five seconds later, I opened my eyes, my face was in the grass uh, on the floor of that, 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 the ground of that altar, I was laid face first in the grass, and I was, I was praying in the Holy Ghost for the first time of my life. I didn't want to get up off the ground because I felt so much love. 
I felt so much love from God just laying there and praying in the Holy Ghost. I, I felt so good. And I, when I tried to get up, I, I tried to come towards him and I kept falling down. My knees would buckle and give out and I would fall down and I'd lay there laughing and I'd try to tell him to help me up. But I'd be just praying in the Holy Ghost, just trying to grab what I could do is no English but praying in tongues. You know, an hour later, we sat with him and he gave us a Bible lesson and a started to teach us John 3 that we must be born again and he said I want to encourage you in the book of Jude he says the Bible says to build up your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost you young men you've been baptized this afternoon that's the only way you fight the battle he said when you walk out of this tent you're going in the wilderness that's the only way is to, is to fight the battle by praying in the Holy Ghost he told us you know, when I walked out of that tent that afternoon, you know, I, I felt brand new. I felt so good after all the sexual abuse, feeling unworthy, feeling rejected, feeling dirty, not feeling like I had a secret. And, you know, God just totally healed my heart. It's delivered me. I, I could love myself again. I had love for me again one more time. You know, as young people, we go through abuse and things in our life. Sometimes we don't feel worthy. Sometimes we don't feel like we can make it. But God healed me through the Holy Spirit. I had life one more time. Hallelujah. So I encourage you, young people, get filled with the Holy Ghost. The answer is Jesus Christ and being baptized through the power of the Holy Ghost. You know, as I got older, in my, and as 13 years old, as I, I got older, I started to travel with my uncle. And, you know, I seen the Lord move and I saw so much miracles. And, you know, I started to get into ministry with him. At the age of 18, I got married. We traveled with my uncle. We were really his youth pastors. As a young boy, I'd travel with him all over Canada and haul in his amp and put up and put up the gospel tent, sleep in the gospel tent. And while there was service on, I would after church I'd make a bed in the pulpit and I just loved God, you know. I get dropped off bloating and bread and a box of chips and twelve cans for the weekend while I stayed and washed the tent and cleaned up the tent. And I thank God for my life. But as I got older, I moved to the city, and I, 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 my dad taught me how to roof. I'm a roofer. Uh, I know how to do sides, siding, soffit, eaves, carpentry. Um, I, I don't do it no more. I've been doing that 17 years. But, you know, as I got older, I, I, I got married to my wife, Leah. And, you know, we, we, we tried to have kids after a couple years together. We lost two kids through pregnancy. And the doctor said... Uh, something wrong with your, 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 your woman parts that, 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 that it's not allowing you to have children. So they told us not to have children no more. You know, and as a man of God, I wanted children and it really broke my heart that the doctor said it's impossible for my wife to have children. You know, uh, uh, you know about maybe a couple years, three years later, you know, we, we adopted foster children. We had four boys until they were 18 years old. They, they lived with us. You know, we built a home, and my, my wife was, you know, at home and raising the children, and I was a roofer. You know, we were youth pastors at the local church in Regina. You know, we were hosting youth services, and, and I was active in the church. You know, I was out there, you know, roofing and, and, and taking care of, you know, of, of, of the youth at, at, at weekends. You know, I, to me, that was, that's what I wanted to do for God. That was my, my dream, was to be a pastor someday, and to be a mighty man of God, to be a preacher for the Lord. And, you know, I, 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 we got married, you know, where, where we had to foster kids. And, you know, through, through our time, you know, we, we got so close with God. And it was January uh, the, the, the 4th, January 25th, 2004, we come home from a, a, a revival service in Regina. It was in a city where about maybe 20 minutes drive from the church. And we got home about 11 o'clock. And I had to, you know, go to the morning service. And I was going to preach. And, you know, I, I, I was, when I went to go and read my Bible before bed and my wife went upstairs. You know, we, we, we had a son. The Lord blessed us with a son. His name is Elijah. He's sitting up here with me. And, you know, uh, the Lord gave us one child. We found out we're having a baby. And, you know, a doctor said we're having a little girl. And, you know, we went home and made a room and, we, we named her Leah Madison, Catherine. 
And then when, when, when my wife gave birth, they had girl stuff for her. And when baby came out, it came out a boy. It wasn't a girl, so <laughs> God, God, God changed the plan. He gave me a son. Amen. And, you know, uh, I thank the Lord for that tonight, that he's a miracle worker. You know, and that, that January 25th, 2004, we came home from church. My wife was breastfeeding my son and took him up to the room. And a little after three in the morning, I went up to go to bed. And uh, when I went up to go to bed, uh, you know, I, I laid down by my wife. And there's, the bed was over here and his crib was here. My son's crib was on this side. My bed was here and there's a window was there and at, at, at my desk at a lamp and the cordless phone. And I laid down and my wife was sleeping and, you know, I... I turned off the, I, I, I just laid down. I didn't have time to turn off the lamp. I was tired. It was after three in the morning. And I laid down and maybe about an hour later, I felt a tug on my pajama sleeve. You know, and I, I looked over. My bedroom door was closed. My wife was laying down and I thought, I don't know. I must have woke up. So I turned the lamp off and another 15 minutes later, I felt another tug again. And this time I got scared. I turned the lamp on and I, I rolled over and I looked at my wife and I said, honey, I said, something's waking me up. I said, something pulled my sleeve. And my wife's a light sleeper. She didn't, she didn't, she didn't, uh, she didn't, she didn't move. So I put my ear to her heart and I couldn't hear the heartbeat inside of her. So I put my ear to her, you know, with, with unbelief. I put my ear to her mouth and I couldn't hear no breath coming out of her. So I... I kind of shook her, but she didn't move, so I grabbed the cordless phone, and I dialed 911, and then the doctor, or the, uh, the, they answered, and I said, my wife's not responding, she's not breathing. That lady said, pick her up, lay her on a flat surface, start doing CPR, we're going to send out an ambulance. You know, I had the cordless phone to my ear, and I was giving her CPR, you know, maybe not even five minutes later, the, the fire trucks would have for the first responders, they kicked my door open. They came running upstairs, and the ambulance were just after them. And they carried my wife down in the living room area. You know, I, and they took her down, and they were working on her. I got really scared and shaky because she wasn't breathing, and I had all this fear on me. And I looked over at my son, and I started to cry out to the Lord. And I said, Lord, don't take her. Don't take my wife, Lord. Don't take my wife. And I was crying out. But you know, God said to me, you know, I remember clearly, he said, she's with me in paradise. You know, and I got off my knees and the ambulance driver said, come on, we're going to take her to the, to the hospital. Or, you know, she still has a little bit of, you know, it might be a little bit of oxygen in her brain. We can still save her. We're going to take her to the hospital and work on her. You know, so they put her in the ambulance and I drove down there and, you know, my family was there and because the revival service was on that weekend, there was a, about, probably about 20 or 30, maybe more Christians were there, were all praying as they worked on an emergency room. And I was standing there with my mom and dad and my family were there and, you know, we're, we're, we're all hoping and praying. And the doctors, they, finally they just said, no, we can't bring her back. She's gone. So they kicked out everybody out of the room and I said, I want to leave him. I want to leave him alone with his wife. I want to leave this... You're the husband? I said, yeah. Well, so I'll give you time alone. Your wife is no longer here with us. So they, they took everybody out and it's me and my son sitting there. My son was looking at his mom and they had her covered up with a sheet and he was saying, Babas, 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 he was saying. You know, I looked at my wife and she was breathless. She was gone. You know, I remember it felt like a sword stabbed me from my back. It came out my front. I felt like my, my world just went upside down. I felt it was unreal. Like I felt this is a dream. I felt like this is not happening. I, I don't know. I just had all these crazy emotions and feelings and my, my ears went, hmm. I couldn't hear, just like death got a hold of me. And I remember just thinking, what am I going to do with my son? Who's going to help us? 
I don't want to go home now. I don't want to go home. I don't want to go to my house no more. <laughs> Felt like the end of the world to me because I was my best friend, my lover, my everything. She promised she'd never leave me. She said, I'll always be with you, honey. 27 years old, she passed away in her sleep, and we buried her. Four months later, the doctors called and said, come in, we want to give you the autopsy report. And, you know, they went through the papers, and they said, you know, we checked her brain. Her brain was normal. There was no head trauma. There was no brain aneurysm. It was good. We, we checked her lungs. There's nothing in her lungs. We checked her throat. Her tongue was in contact. Her blood was good. She had a sandwich about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. I said, uh, there's nothing. We can't, we, there's no cause of death. She's 27 years old. She shouldn't be dead. She should be alive sitting with you, but we can't say it's his death because she's an adult. All we can say is it's unremarkable. I just signed it. You've got a sign here, and here's your death certificate for your wife. He said, I believe God took her home and that was her expiry date. And I didn't like that because it broke my heart. I, I went home and I was, you know, four months after burying her, I went home. I was wanting an answer. I wanted to blame cancer. I was wanting to blame a sickness for the loss of my wife. I wanted to know why, why did she die? Why did... What did she eat or, 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 or what caused her death? But there, there was no answer. The doctor said it's unremarkable. Even the do man didn't know. The doctors didn't know why she left. All I knew was that somebody was trying to wake me up. That's all I knew. The Bible says we're not promised tomorrow. And I learned it the hard way when my wife went home. I woke up. She was not there no more. And when I got home, she's not home no more. She's home with the Lord right now. I was broken and God healed me. You know, I, I went through so much. You know, a year after her death, I, I was so angry at God. I didn't want to go to church no more. I became mad at God. I became angry because he took my wife. I said, I want to go to church no more because we always sat in the second row at the front, me and my foster boys and my baby boy. I said, Pastor, I can't go to church. I'm so broken. I said, I don't want to go no more because my life is broken. I'm mad at God. He took my wife. After 14 months of losing her, I, I became angry. The Bible talks about Cain. It says in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, and Adam, Adam, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and conceived and bare Cain and said, I have got the man from the Lord. And she again bore his son Abel. And Abel was the keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground, an offering unto the Lord. And Abel was, he also brought up first leaves of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and, and to his offering, but Cain, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, he was angry. And his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So I became angry at God for taking my wife. 
I became upset that he'd taken my wife. I, I ended up giving my children back to the foster system, social services. I took my son who was lonesome for his mom and I took him to my mom's house. I knocked on the door and I said, here, take him. I can't raise him no more. He needs a woman. He needs a mother. I dropped him off and I went home. I wept and I cried and you know where my wife changed her clothes. Her clothes were on the floor yet and her closet were filled with her clothes and shoes. And we had a dresser here by the bed and she had all her jewelry, perfumes. I didn't let no one come in and bother her stuff after she died. After 14 months, I let it be the same. I was sitting at a table and I was crying. I was mad. I said, God, why don't you take a drunkard? Why don't you take a drug dealer? Why don't you take somebody that don't want you? But why don't you take my wife? You could have took somebody else, Lord. I was, I was in my own emotions and my own feelings. I, was, I was, wasn't listening. I, I allowed all my emotions and feelings to get the best of me. So I walked out of my home and I went to the liquor store. I never drank or did drugs at the time and never did those. And I went to the liquor store and I put a shopping cart there and I put all kinds of booze in the shopping cart. You know, I was so mad at God. I threw my salvation away. I went home and I locked myself in and I started to drink all alone. Started to party, started to, I didn't just remember drinking all kinds of alcohol. And a couple of days later, I, I, I went out to the house to the bar and I started partying around and buying drinks and people started coming home. And after four months, I trashed my house and partied up everything and smashed it up. And six months later, I had no more savings and, and I got kicked out of my house. And I went back there six months later and they had a big garbage bin in the front and the doors were locked up and they kicked me out of my home. I had nowhere to live after I was homeless. Stayed wherever I can. And a few times I'd wake up in the parks because I had nowhere to sleep. I became very mad at God. I became very angry. I'd beat up, I'd go to the bar and I'd see couples dancing and I'd go beat up the couples because the man had his girlfriend or his wife and they're just kissing to slow songs and I'd get up and I'd just start beating up on that man. I, I got lickings, I gave lickings, I broke my, my finger many times, my, my, my fist many times on faces, you know, from, from being mad and angry. I, I attempted suicide a couple times, but God spared my life. He didn't take my life as I tried to end it. Many times I ended up in a hospital from alcohol poisoning. I drink for Weeks and months drink till I was sober. I damaged my liver. I damaged my kidneys. One night I went to a party and, you know, I, I have a lot of family. My mom has 14 brothers and sisters. So I have a lot of cousins my age and some of them are in gangs. I went with them to parties because they were in gangs and I hung around with them because you know, I had nothing to do and I, I liked to fight so we were hanging around. And, you know, we went to this party and they, they left early and I didn't know that was the wrong, the wrong gang they took me to. And, you know, uh, later on that night, I got beat up really bad at that party. All those guys, about 15 of them, you know, I remember fighting and I took about maybe four down with me and that was it. They, they all came after me in the backyard and they had shovels and they beat me up and I was, I was stabbed up. And after they beat me up, they put me in the back of a pickup truck and they took me out of Regina and they left me in the field. A nurse that worked at the hospital said she was coming into work in Regina. She said, she said I was coming in at 6.30 this morning. It was daylight. The sun was just cracked to shine. And she said, I seen this tall lady dragging a bag through the field or a blanket. So I got maybe 50 yards closer. That was a, a lady. She was dragging a body. When I pulled up my car, she said, that lady laid this body there. And I, I seen you covered in blood. And I told that lady... I'm going to get the blanket for him. And she went to her vehicle. She opened the trunk. She grabbed the blanket. She came back. She said that lady was no longer around. She looked, where did she go? It's an open field. It's the Perry's. So she put me in her car. She took me to the hospital. And I woke up a few days later, beat up. My eyes couldn't, couldn't open my eyes. I was laying there. That lady was there. She said, I've been here a couple of days. 
the police are here. We don't know who you are. We don't know what happened to you. I said, I don't know. I just now got beat up. You know, I remember laying in that bed feeling hopeless, feeling like, what am I going to do? You know, my mom came by my side in that evening and, you know, they didn't know where I was. I almost got my life taken. But, you know, I, I still had anger in God and I still went partying and, and I started to fight people and get into high-speed chases and got all these charges of a common assault and assault causing bodily harm times four. Five drinking and driving tickets. Two escaping from the police by high-speed chase. Assaulting a police officer. And all these, I had all these criminal records because I was angry. And that judge, they arrested me one night for driving down the main street at 100 kilometers and you know, they arrested me and they took me in and you know they took me before a judge the next day and that judge read all my criminal record and he said you know young man I don't know you he said but you don't have a criminal record he said but I'm going to tell you this I'm not releasing you today I'm going to, I'm going to send you away for six months and bring you back he said you don't have a, a youth criminal record you never had a driving record I looked at your, at your history, you're never in trouble with the law, but out of nowhere, in the last 60 days, the Crown Prosecutor had a meeting and said they want 18 years for your sentence. He said, but I don't want to send you to the penitentiary because if I sentence you today and give you 18 years, you'll come out somebody that, that you're not going to be. And you've never been in trouble with the law, so I'm going to give you time to seek counsel and get a lawyer. I will see you in six months and you know he, he slammed that thing down and I was still shackled up and they took me out to the prison and you know when I got there they stripped all my clothes off of me and you know they, 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 they made my shower. Me and nine men came in a van and they put us in a, down at the bus, basement of the prison and they took our clothes off and made a shower. You know they saw all the stab wounds and the, the marks on my body and they thought I was a gang member so they put me up in 1F. It was a gang unit. You know, I, I went up there. And it was about four days later in that prison. I, I was sitting on my, my bed and, you know, I was watching, the, you know, the outside. I was looking at the city and I started to feel bad. I was hungover and I was wanting cocaine and I was wanting booze. I was feeling lonesome for my baby boy. I start to regret, regret all of the drinking, all of the fighting. And I said, why am I here anyway? I said, oh yeah, God took my wife. I buried all my sorrows with drugs and alcohol. And I remember sitting on that bed and I was just punching myself in the head and punching my chest and saying, man, I hate myself. Man, I hate what I did. Man, I'm in such a big mess. They don't want to let me go. I can't go home. Man, I hate myself. Why did I do this to myself? I should just die now. I should just take my life now. I was so frustrated with this mess I made with my life. And I laid on that concrete bed and I, tears were going down my eyes lightly and I grabbed that little rubber mattress and I put it over my head in the corner. I ran to water, I kept flushing the toys and I whispered to the Lord. I said, Lord God, I made a mess of my life. And I'm not happy with the decision I made and why I'm here. I said, I made such a terrible, terrible mess. So I was mad at you. I was mad at you, God. I know I shouldn't blame you, but I got to take ability now for my actions and my words. I put that blanket, little rubber mat in my head and I whispered to the concrete ground and I, I said, God, I said, if you hear me from this prison all the way through the universe, straight to the heaven, I said, God, if you can hear me, I know your Bible, I know the word says you're God of a second chance. And I really made a mess of my life, Lord. I start telling them all the bad things I did. And I said, God, if you can hear me, 
I want a second chance. If you just heal me of my loss of my wife, I'll live for you. I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. You win, God. I give up. I said, God, forgive me. I said, come into my heart. Wash me and cleanse me, Lord. Lord, if you heal me, I said, if you heal me, if you forgive me, if you can even hear what I'm saying, Lord. This is what I ask of you today. Give me a sign, Lord, because I'm so lost. Give me a sign. Give me a Bible, Lord, I said. If you hear me and you give me a Bible, I'll, I'll preach for you. Three hours later, I, I made my bed and I laid on my bed and I was, uh, I was uh, quiet and you know, we were locked up for 35 days and, you know, it was the, the fourth day I was there and about eight that evening before the sun went down, there was a knock on my, my concrete wall and it was a, 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 a man and he said to me, hey, you have something to read? I said, no, I don't. Do you have the newspaper? I said, I have no news. No, I don't got nothing in here. He said, you've been there how long? I said, four days. I mean, the guards never gave me nothing. I said, no. Yeah, I'm going to give you something to read, but give me back. I said, sure. Put your arm out the bar. I said, put my arm out the bar like this and really read. Come on, push your arm. I kept pushing. I felt a little thin book, you know, and I got a hold of it, and I, I pulled it back into my cell, and that was the Holy Bible ripped in half at the Old and the New Testament. Right at Malachi and Matthew, it was ripped right in half. And I saw it was the Old Testament, and I just started crying. I was crying, and, and you know, I, that, that man didn't know I was crying, but he said, hey, don't smoke the Bible. He said, I'll, I'll give you the New Testament, but I'm going to ask you questions on the Old Testament. He said, I'll give you the complete Bible if you answer them right. You know, so God answered my prayer. God answered my prayer by giving me a Bible in the prison. God, God, God heard my prayer all the way from that jail cell, all the way through the clouds past Orion's belt into the universe. God heard my prayer. He heard my cry. He heard, amen, everything that I told him. He heard my vows that I made him. God heard me in the darkest hour of my life. God heard me. You know, I, 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 I started to read the Bible and the Bible said that Cain, Cain brought the fruit of the ground as his offering unto the Lord. But also, what did God say about the ground? God said in chapter 3 of the 17, he says, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. So Cain was giving God. Cain didn't have any, he didn't want that offering from Cain. Cain was offering God what never pleased God. And Cain was angry because God was not taking his offering. And I was angry because I felt like the world owed me something. I felt like God owed me something when he took my wife and I became angry. I felt like God owes me big now, he took my wife. But God did not come down to my emotions or my feelings. God saw me as an angry person. The Lord said, I created man in my image and my likeness. That was his daughter. He just took his daughter home. He took my wife. He took, that was his daughter. He just took her home. And here I was being mad and angry. Cain was angry because God was not pleased with his offering. And I became like Cain. I became angry like Cain. And I was giving God an offering that God did not want. He did not want my anger. He did not want my emotions. Come on, we serve a life. God, uh, a living God, uh, and that's what Cain was. Uh, he was a tiller of the ground. Come on, he was a tiller of the ground, uh, and it's not by works uh, unless any man boasts. Uh, come on, and that's why Cain was angry because God uh, was not pleased uh, in his offering. Come on, I don't know where you are tonight. Uh, maybe you're going through some things uh, and some trials, uh, and you're offering God uh, what he doesn't want, uh, and that's what I did. I gave God all my anger, uh, you know, but Cain, uh, he said, but unto Cain, to his offering, he had no respect. 
And Cain was very wroth. He was very angry. What are we, what are we offering to God? What offering are we bringing to God? Me, I was bringing him anger. And God made me take responsibility to what I was offering him. Maybe tonight you're angry. God don't want that offering no more. That's what I gave God was my anger. I didn't understand at the time I was operating my emotions and my feelings. God answered my prayer. He was merciful. So, 35 days after being locked up, uh, I started to hear the voice of God speak to me. Just like the particle son, he came to himself, and that's what I did. I came to myself. I repented. I asked the Lord back into my life one more time. And I meant business with him. I had the fear of God in my life. 35 days later, I was sitting in my cell, we were locked up. And the Lord said to me, I said, Lord, I want to go and have a shower. I want to phone my son. It's been 35 days since they took us out of this cage and let us go to the back to shower. I used the phone. I had peace. I wasn't angry at God no more. He started to talk back to me. I started to have faith in God. And the Lord said to me, well, why don't you ask me to open the doors? So I sat on that bed and I said, doors be open. I didn't open and I want to get angry again. But I didn't get angry this time. I said, Lord, you're funny. And I, I laughed with him. You know, when uh, Cain was angry, he got kicked out of the presence of God. Jonah was angry. And he ran from the presence of God. So anger made me run from God. But now that I'm back with God, I said, Lord, you're funny, you're humorous. He said, ask in my name and I will do it. I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I command these cell bars to open. I can shower in the name of Jesus. Right after I said, in the name of Jesus, the guard yells at the other end, pull your bars. And all you hear is, and those, you have to get up and pull your, your gate. You pull that bar open. And I looked out, and everybody else was looking out, and we're all, everyone's all cheering. And I was looking, and I said, I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, we went back to my cell, and I was wondering, what I don't have no clean clothes. I'm just going to shower anyway. And I looked, there was a lineup for the phones. There was a lineup for the shower. I went over to this guy next to me. His name was Dave. I said, thank you for the Bible. He started asking me all the questions. Sum up the Old Testament to me. I did. I did. I told him everything that I learned and how God chose. Uh, and God had Adam and Eve in the garden. And I started to talk about uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And I started telling about the fathers uh, of faith. Uh, I started talking about the Israelites uh, and all the bondages and uh, how they argued and chatted with God. And, and, and Jesus has a name, Emmanuel, and God is with us. And I started telling him all the stories of, of the prophets. Uh, I started to talk to him. Uh, and this man was on fire. He said, he said, he said I, 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 that, all right, you, you can have the second. I'm going to give you a brand new Bible. He gave me a brand new Bible. You know, he became my prayer partner. After two months of being with him in that prison, he went off to go serve a sentence. He was a murderer. He went off to the penitentiary to go do his time. He used to write me letters from the penitentiary to where I was at. So two months being with this man, I was alone. 25 men were gang members. There's 25 of us, so 24 were gang members. And I, I was sitting there and I was saying, Lord, save some Christians. Let some Christians get in trouble and come to jail so they can read the Bible with me and pray with me. Let, let a Christian get caught out there. 
Let someone that loves you get in trouble to come to jail with me for a while. But you guys are lucky it didn't happen. <laughs> no, it's getting... But nobody came in <laughs> as a Christian. And the Lord said, you're a fisher of man. The man next to you, the man at the end, the man right on your left, the man on your right. So one day I sat out in, a, in, my, in my jail cell on the floor looking this way and watching the gang members rap and fight and swear and get on a phone and tell the girlfriend you're going to get a lick and when I get out, where are you? Huck me at home for two days. Sit and listen to all this garbage and rapping and I felt all alone and the Lord said, you're a fisherman. Start winning souls here. So I got up and they locked us up at 1 o'clock till 2 o'clock in prison. They call that happy hour because they lay down and sleep for an hour. But within that time frame, they, they come and count the inmates. And after one hour, they'll, they'll go and they'll say, the, uh, at 2 o'clock, they'll say, the count is good, the count's correct. And then they'll, they'll unrelease us. So at about 12.45, I went to the back and I, I boiled my water. There's a kettle back there. I boiled my water. I put in my, 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 my tea in there. And I, I usually read through that hour and cry out to God on my knees for an hour. So I had my, 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 my tea ready to go and... I come walking back to the unit and there was a, you, you can't look at men in the prison because they ain't got no curtains. So if you look in a jail cell, you'll see them using the bathroom. And they don't like that when you look at them. So all on one side is from 25 all the way down. I was in cell number seven. And on this side was just a little catwalk right here where we'd walk. There was bars here you can see through. There's a, a, about maybe 50 feet far. There's big windows there. And below was another unit. You can see the, the other men down there walking. Right at the end is uh, where the guards all sit. And all the way this other end is where all the shower room is. There's, a, uh, there's a doors to go in the shower. This side was the back opening for a TV. So I went to the back where they had the microwave and the, the kettle there. And I was boiling my water and I had my tea. And I was walking back. And the Lord looked, I looked at that man sitting on his, on his bed. You know, I looked at him and you know, he looked at me real mad. And the Lord said, I want you to pray for him. And I looked at him. He looked at me mean and scary. He was a gang member. I didn't want to. I just kept on walking to the back. I, I put my tea down on, a, on my desk. I opened my Bible. And the Lord said, very clear, go back and lay your hands on him. I went walking to the back out of the fear in my mind and my heart. I said, Lord, this is you. I'm going to go anyway. I went back there and I knocked on that brother's wall and his, on his bar on the concrete wall. I said, hey, brother. And he looked at me. His name was Ziggy. He looked up at me and he said, what do you want? I said, you know, Ziggy, I said, uh, I'm going to tell you something. I said, Jesus Christ loves you. You know, brother Ziggy, if you were the only man on earth, Christ would still, God would still send Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you. That's how much God loves you. God loves you that he would still send Jesus to die for you. And he stood up and he walked towards me. I thought we were going to fight. I thought he was going to fight me or call his backup to come and take me out. But he came up to me and he knelt down and he started crying and he grabbed my legs together and he was squeezing me, shaking and crying. He said, you know, this morning I woke up. My buddies did an armed robbery. I'm here for armed robbery. I was there, but I didn't get any of the money. They blamed it on me. I'm looking at 10 year sentence. He said, I don't want to go to jail. I, 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 I want to tell you something. He said, can you read me the Bible? I can't read. I said, yes. I led him to the Lord. And he said, hold on. Uh, before you go, I'm going to give you something. He went to his bed and he, he grabbed his little rubber mattress and he, he gave me a rope. In that prison, they give you thin sheets. He cut them in strips. And he braided it. He made a rope. He said, at 1 o'clock today, I was going to hang myself and, and take my life. But I looked in this old tinted mirror, this bent up steel. And I said, if there is a God, I'm calling on any God. If there's any God out there that loves me, this ugly human being. I won't take my life if there's a God out there. He said, half an hour, I was laying on my bed crying and saying my goodbyes. I live on the streets of Musha. I don't know my mom and dad. I was in foster homes. Nobody's going to miss me anyway. And I, I thought I'm going to take my life. And then you called me. You, you told me to come. I want to live for Jesus. I will live for this Jesus man. But you got to read me the Bible. And he gave me that rope. Ziggy was the first man on that unit to give his life to the Lord. Every day Ziggy would wake up and come and sit in my cell. And I'd read him the Bible. I'd pray over him at nights. We'd have a little prayer meeting before he went to bed. 
Four months later, there were seven men that I wanted to the Lord on that unit. Seven men out of 25 of us serving the Lord. So the other 18 men were still gang members. The fourth month mark, they came in my cell and said, that's enough, Wessequit. Don't be preaching that gospel no more. Don't be preaching the Bible. That's the white man way. I got very angry because that's not the white man way. The Bible says that the Bible is written by men of God that were inspired by the Spirit of the Lord. I said, that's not a no nationality God. That's, he's not, it's not a white man way. <laughs> but they didn't understand the gang members. They said, well, tomorrow at 4 o'clock, if you don't take that Bible, we're going to kill you. You better leave tomorrow before 4 or even right now. And they threatened me and they walked out of my cell. They said they were going to take my life for, for believing in the gospel. I had the seven of us sitting there and they, they saw and heard. Fear came over me because my life was threatened. I felt very little like I said, I wish my brother would be here or, or, or my cousins would be here. We'll just kick these guys, beat them up. I felt so hopeless. I felt so small. 10.30 came. The boys left my room and they locked us up and I was sitting on my cell and I was feeling like, man, I wish I had someone to help me fight tomorrow at 4 o'clock. It was winter time and I, I had four sheets tied in the corner, knots, so the sheets would be a little warmer. And I went to bed that night and the guards come at 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock. Then again at 8.30 they unlock us. So at the 3 o'clock count, the guards, they come and they shine a light in your cell and they walk away. They count you, they make sure they can see your hair and your feet. If they can't see you, you're covered, they'll call your name and they'll wake you up. But they walk by, they counted and they went out and they slammed the door. 3 a.m. and 10 minutes later, I, I was cold and I looked, my blankets fell off of me. And where my cell was is, you know, it's two, two big doors, but, you know, two big sliding doors, but this one door never opened. This one did. You had to pull it open and then you can walk in and out. The door area here, this other door didn't open. My bed was right here. All our, all our cells are made the same. Our bed is right here. And, and when it ends right about here, there's a, a toilet bowl there. And on this side is just a little opening with a tin mirror, a little tin desk. And then you could that this little walkway to go in and out. You can put your hand on this side and your palms on this side. I that's how big it was. You could put your fingertips this way and you could touch the wall to wall. It was about maybe nine feet this way to the end. Is this enough to sleep there, a little toilet bowl? And that jail was made into a hundred year old jail. It was big sliding doors. In the summertime, these little wee birds would fly through their, their old fashioned windows. The birds would fly through and bust. And the government would never fix those windows because it probably cost them more. It was an old jail. But it was cold that winter and my blankets fell fell off of me and in the middle of the night I, I grabbed my blankets and I pulled them over me outside of my jail cell as I pulled the blankets over me there stood an angel and God's the witness there was an angel standing outside my cell you know that night I went to bed they made a threat to my life I was crying out to God to take my life I was crying out to God I said God don't let them hurt me just take me home so at three in the morning, I, an angel stood outside my cell and to me, he looked like Jesus. He stood there and where my feet were, I looked up at him and he had long hair pushed behind his head. He had a robe on, his hood was on right here. His hair was tucked down behind his ears and coming down. He was standing like this. He was looking directly at me, but his eyes were closed. His face was looking directly at me and his hands were like this. And I could see his robe come down his shoulders up to here. And his hands were crossed. And he was just looking at me. And I looked at him. His eyes were closed. And I thought, this is the end. This is where I'm going to go to heaven now. And my mind was wondering what's going to happen next. Maybe about five minutes of looking at one another with his eyes closed. And a dark voice had echoed my cell. He said, Fear not! As a soul, like an authority came out of his mouth. He opened his mouth and he said, fear not. And when he said, fear not, the Holy Ghost just, whew, it's like the Holy, it's like a blanket or something. Who hit me when, it, when the Holy Ghost hit my, my spiritual being? I just went, Yadabaki, 
I start praying in the Holy Spirit and that angel, it didn't run away or pop. He just faded away. You couldn't see him no more. And I, I was just praying in the Holy Ghost. I prayed for three in the morning till 8.30. They unlocked it, the, the, my cell. Everybody was going to use the phone and I was praying in tongues. The guards come and check the walk by. What's wrong with you? And I, I was trying to tell them I'm okay. But every time I tried to speak, I was praying in tongues. Uh, and to tell you tonight, uh, in prison, uh, you know, no one prayed over me to fill me with the Holy Ghost. Uh, when that angel came, uh, God regenerated. Uh, God gave me the new birth uh, one more time. I started to pray in tongues. I remember just feeling so good. I knew I wasn't alone no more. I knew God had done something in my life. I had an encounter with the Lord God Almighty with an angel that came and said, fear not. You know, and all that fear left my mind and my body. And here comes 4 o'clock. About 3.30 that afternoon, the, the, the brothers that were serving God were sitting on my bed. And they said, Wesley, take the Bible and go. These guys are crazy. They will kill you. How many people were killed since you've been here? How many people were taken out? I said, lots. I said, but I'm not going to go. I seen an angel. And this angel said, fear not. I cannot fear. I want to see what God's going to do. I said, I'm going to stay here. And they said, we're not going to see this. And they all left. Four o'clock comes. I was sitting on, my, on, a, on that toilet bowl, the cardboard there. That's where I sat. And I was waiting. I was praying in the Holy Ghost. I was building up my faith just praying in the Holy Ghost. And here comes 15 of the men still outside my cell. And that higher up said, you got 10 seconds, Wesakwe, to get out of here. Or we're going to come and we're going to kill you. I'm going to start it. The boys are going to finish it. I already told you last night, take that Bible and go. One, two, three. He got down to, got up to 10. He said, okay, five more seconds. I could feel the Holy Ghost all over me and I sat there. I was shaking. I was waiting for something to happen. He counted down to five seconds and he said, all right, I'm coming in. And the boys are going to come after me. And he, you know, he took a step, but he never touched the floor of my cell. As he, just before he did that, he came coming like this. And when he put up his fist, something grabbed his fist and he tried to swing at this fist and something grabbed him and he's trying to swing and he, he, where, where, where he was coming in, he was trying to swing. My bed was right here and somehow he got spun around this way and he landed against the wall. He landed on the bed and he's going, ah, trying to fight something. He landed on the floor and I was looking at him. The gang members were looking. He's resting. All of a sudden, he got maneuvered and flipped on my bed and he was looking up going, ah, and I was just like, ugh. He stopped. His gang members looked at me and I looked at him. And he was sleeping. It's, uh, he just passed out. His gang members looked at another and they ran down to the end. For two hours that man laid on my bed. And all I could do was pray in the Holy Ghost. I said, Lord, this is somebody's son. This is somebody's dad. This is somebody's brother. Somebody's uncle. I said, Lord God, you, you saved me. You can save him. Two hours of praying, he woke up. And he sat up and he looked at me and he said, what are you doing in my jail cell? And he saw all the scriptures I put on the wall. And in that prison, they give you loose leaf paper to write letters. And they give you a see-through tube of a t toothpaste. Has no taste. This feels like eggly gel in your mouth. So I used that toothpaste and put scriptures on my wall. The toothpaste was the glue and I used the loose leaf paper. I put it on my wall because I kept getting lonesome. And every time I, I read the Bible, it would take away the lonesome feeling. So I had the word all over my cell. And everywhere I went by my mirror, by my bed, he's looking, I'm not in, your, I'm not in, your, I'm not in my cell. And he, he got up and he went walking out. Two hours later, it was quiet. Supper was already served. And two hours later, it was quiet and the higher up sent five men to my cell. Gang members came and they said, what's the way they, they want to have a meeting with you at the back? I said, what? Higher up wants to have a meeting with you at the back room in the shower. So I said, okay. The other brothers that were serving the Lord, the other six men were serving the Lord with me. Seven of us. They said, don't go back there. They're going to beat you up. That's where they kill people. Don't go back there. I said, I got to go. The angel said, fear not, I'm, the Lord's with me. 
So I got up and I walked with those men to the back and that shower room is, you know, about maybe 15 feet by 15 feet and they had four showers there. There's no curtains or nothing. There's just showers. There's a big steel door. This is a 100-year-old jail, so a big steel door. They had those big old-fashioned jumbo keys. So there was a big keyhole there and that higher up made me stand in front of him and the gang members stood around. He said, we're having a meeting. We've got some other gang members on one seat right across and they're watching. They could see that eye hole. They're all looking, a bunch of eyes looking at me and let me look at him, let me look at him. And they're looking at me and I looked at higher up and he said, you know what? I'm going to tell you something today. He said, I wrestled with something I never saw. It was big. It had me by my arms. He said, but I'm, I'm, I just told the boys, in that prison they give you, uh, the chaplain comes and gives you a cross if you give your life to Jesus. And she gave me a black cross with a, a black rope with a, a brown cross, a necklace. And he grabbed my necklace. He said, whoever is a Christian and wears this cross. I told everybody and it's going out throughout all the jail for no one to touch the Christian men in this place. From cell 1 to 7 is yours. But 7 to 25 is ours. You can do your church thing over there. We'll do our thing on this side. Leave us alone. Do you have an agreement? I said, yeah, I have an agreement. He shook my hand and all the boys shook my hand. I walked down the cell. I walked out of there. I was praying in the Holy Ghost. I told the men what happened. Come on, God, those, those gang members, they bowed down to the name of Jesus. Uh, they didn't make me bow down to them. I never bowed down to no other gods. Uh, but those gang members bowed down and said, we ain't going to touch nobody that, that is a Christian that calls on the name of Jesus. That was four months of being in that prison. The sixth month mark came. There was a lot of work that God did. All of those men, 25 men, were serving Jesus. 25 gang members gave their hearts to the Lord and four guards gave their lives to Jesus. Four guards that worked our unit, the regular guards out of a 12-man shift, four of them gave their lives to Jesus because they saw the signs, the wonders, and the miracles. They gave us the TV room for service. They're bringing us instruments. They brought us a big screen TV. They brought us popcorn. They brought us pop. They brought us drums and guitar. And at that one year mark, uh, they, they, they shackled us up and said, you're going out to Keys Reserve and you're Chris, you're the preacher. The band can go with you. We, the, 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 the director of the jail seen what you're doing. She, the chaplain's going to take you out to this first nation camp meeting and you're the preacher do you want to go I said sure come on <laughs> so the day came we went out after one year we went out and I preached the gospel souls got saved pastor Alan Osoup he'll testify that I was there we preached the gospel under that service there when it took us by shackles and they brought us back by shackles and when they pull us in the prison as they um, pulled in the garage and the chaplain got out and she was crying as, as the guards were taking the shackles off her. She was crying and, and, and the guard said, what's wrong? She want to say something to these, to these five young men that came out to serve. I want to tell you, young men, thank you for not running away. Thank you for, for being safe to me. Thank you. Jesus loves you. That's something God can do. He changed us. Two years later, I'm going to close with this. 28 months I was in that prison. I kept going back to court on a shackled up. When that, the Lord threw that gang member around and I went to court and was riding a van and they bring all different men in that prison and put them one van into the city to go to court and I was in that, all those gang members were in the van and I was listening to these gang members talk. Oh, there's a mighty preacher up on one half. Oh, man, one of, our, one of our members went to go and take him out, and he was thrown on a roof and dragged down the hallway. I don't know what happened, but I, I'm too scared to go up there. And I was just sitting in that van, just chuckling. Eh? Anybody here from one half, does anyone know what's going on up there? We can't touch the Christians. I was just quiet, just giggling, man. And I didn't tell him that I was up there, and that was me. <laughs> but, you know, I kept going to court, and, you know, God was having favor in my life. The 28 months of being in that prison, I, I, I went to bed. I was going. To, I was nine o'clock, and I was going. To, uh, it was nine o'clock. Uh, we had the ping pong room for for Bible services and 
Bible teaching and services. And 28 months later, I went to my cell and I looked out the city of Regina. It was the end of March 31st. The snow was gone and it was beautiful out. And I, I looked at the city and God said, what is wrong? You know, and I just started to cry. I said, Lord, I said, it's been over 28 months. Two years I've been in this place. 28 months. I never asked you to let me go home, but I want to go home now. I said, but I know why I came here, because I was mad at you. I said, if I go, if I leave, I know I'll probably backslide and not serve you no more. I don't know what I'll do. But if you heal me, if you take this broken heart, if you take this broken heart from me, I'll, I'll promise to preach the gospel if you just heal this. I always have this pain when I breathe, Lord, and I was here, and you didn't heal me. I said, if you heal me, Lord, then you can set me free. And I cried and I laid down and it was 9 p.m. at night. And I, I went into the sleep and in, in my sleep I, I woke up. I was sitting on a bench. These two little girls were playing, maybe what, seven or six-year-old little girls were just giggling and laughing, playing on this apparatus that had a slide in their lap. And I was just looking at them. Man, I've never seen kids in a long time. And there was like maybe 20 feet from me in their plane. I looked up, I could see a beautiful gold city. It was beautiful grass. I, I looked down, I had, no, I, had, I, I had no socks on. I never put up my feet and I put my foot down and the, the grass would bow down. It wouldn't prick my foot. And all I know my wife, Lee, that passed away, she came to the left side of me. She was about two feet. She wasn't touching the ground. She was like floating, I guess, two, about a foot and a half. She came around this way. And I looked at her and I saw her. I never saw her. I was, since she passed away, I looked at her and I started to be in my flesh. I started to cry. I said, Leah. I stood up to reach for her and she stood back. She didn't have any emotion. Like she missed me. And I didn't have none of those feelings. She just looked at me and said, preach the gospel. Raise up Elijah. Jesus is coming soon. And I, I, I didn't care to hear that because I wanted to hug her. So I, I tried to grab her and hug her. And she moved back a second time. And she said, Jesus is coming soon. Raise up Elijah and preach the gospel. And then all of a sudden, I, I tried to go a third time, but this time I, I was in my cell. I, I, I must have rolled off my bed. I looked up, and she was going down. To, it was like a light. I was going down. I could see it. And I was crying. I said, Leah. And she said again the third time, preach the gospel. Jesus is coming soon. And when she said that, I started crying. I feel the sword. It came out the, from the front. It went, it went out of me. And I was just praying in the Holy Ghost. And I, I, I felt freedom. I felt so free. I was on my knees crying. And I, I sat on my bed and I was just crying. And all of a sudden, it was uh, uh, the guards banged on my door. And they unlocked the door. Two guards that were doing the night shift, they knocked on my door. And that guard said, it's 630 Grab your bags, you're going. I thought, where am I going? I don't want to go to the hole. I don't want to go to another unit. I like it here. He said, no, pack your stuff. I grabbed my Bibles and my study notes and my toothpaste and my shampoo and my underarm deodorant. I was packing my bags. I said, well, where are you taking me? He said, we can't tell you. Take your stuff now. Let's go. I begged. They gave me a garbage bag and I put all my stuff in there and they took me out of the prison and they said, there's the steel gate. Walk to that gate. There's a little speaker. They press the button once. They'll, they'll, they'll let you out. I said, well, where am I going? He said, well, we just got a call an hour ago. The judge said, your charge has been dropped. You're free to go. We can't keep you here no more. And I said, no way. <laughs> I, said, and I said, really? He said, yeah. So I got to the first gate where the barbed wires were. And I stood there and I, you know, I thought of St. Shaw Redemption. I thought they were going to shoot me for escaping. I thought, I don't know. And I pressed that button. That guy said, come on, West Squid, you're free to go. And that big door buzzed open and I went through and you know, I got to the second gate. And you know, I, I started crying because it was April 1st, 2008. I thought, this must be April Fool's joke. I pressed it again and that door opened up. And I went through and the gate closed and there I was looking, wow, I'm free. <laughs> I would just cry, I don't thank you, God, I'm free. I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't have an address. I don't have a home. I don't know where I'm going to live. I said, the clothes that I have on belong to the, to, the, to, the, to the prison. They told me I got two weeks to mail back my sweater, my T-shirt, my underwear, my socks. I, I got two weeks to come and drop them off. I said, God, I don't know where I'm going to go, but you set me free. You delivered me. I'm no longer in prison. I don't know where I'm going to go, but I'm going to live for you. I'm going to preach the word. I remember my vow. I'm going to live for you, Jesus. 
18 years ago, the Lord delivered me. 2008, God set me free from that prison. I know tonight there's people here that are in a prison. Tonight the prison door is open. But tonight you're in a prison. Tonight you may have sickness. You might have went through sexual abuse. You might have a bad marriage. You may have a bad home. You may have a bad addiction to drugs or alcohol. Maybe you're like me. One time a suicide would follow me and tell me how to kill myself. Tell me to wait for the right day. Wait for the right time for the right person to break the last straw. Maybe that lying devil is telling you to end your life. But Jesus is here tonight and he will set you free. Jesus is here to break the chains. Jesus is here to deliver you. If he could set me free, he could set you free tonight. I could tell you tonight my mother would pray while I was in that prison for 28 months. My mom would cry out to the Lord. She would pray for my protection. She would pray that God would deliver me. Come on parents if you have children tonight in the prison system, don't stop praying. Don't stop. Don't give up on them. God could deliver them. God could set them free. God could heal them. God could use them. Today 12 years I've been a pastor. 12 years ago I, I, God gave me one more of his daughters. I married my wife, Crystal. I didn't find her in a bar or on the streets. I went to a revival service in Regina, another church. I was sitting there and she walked in late and you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think anything. You know, I, a prophet, a man of God said, uh, said to me, he said, you're gonna get married in three months, brother. God's gonna bring her to you, don't look for her. So I never looked for her. But Crystal walked into this one service I went to the revival. I shared my testimony. She was in the front row listening. And I walked out. I'm a very shy person because I'm Cree. We're all shy. <laughs> so, you know, I went back that night. I went home from that spe special meetings in Regina. And I went back, you know, to home. And I thought, well, who is this lady? She didn't lust at me or flirt with me or nothing. I kept my eyes on the Lord ever since I got out of prison. You know, and uh, it was Sunday night. I was home, and the Lord said, go to that service. You know, and I, I thought, okay, I'll go back. I have a sister, Charity. You know, I said, come with me to church tonight. She said, no, I'll give you, give you 40 bucks. Said, I don't know. I'll think about it. She said, I'm hungover. I don't know if I want to go to church. So I stayed in my room and I was praying and she came back and said, Hey, I think you like a girl. It's sixty dollars and I'll come with you. I said, Okay. Sixty bucks. We went to that service and my wife that I married today, she didn't show up and I was church was over. I was like, Oh, okay, Lord, well, maybe it wasn't you. And I was walking out and she was walking in. We just shared a smile and we walked out. You know, a couple of days later I was roofing and I got a text on my on my inbox and Facebook and it was Crystal and she said, hey brother, I, I, I'm not lusting, I just want you to know, uh, um, I know you're single and, 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 and I'm not trying to flirt with you, but your testimony really blessed me, she said. Your testimony really blessed me and I'm going to keep you in my prayers, she said, and I thank you for, for sharing your testimony in our home service, she said. And a couple days later of talking, we went for coffee, four months later we got married, we've been married 12 years now, hallelujah. <laughs> We have, four, we have four girls, and I have my son. I have a 17-year-old, a 16-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 10-year-old. Israel, Rebecca, Callie, and Vienna. My four daughters are home with my wife right now. My wife couldn't be here this weekend. Uh, uh, our babysitter, uh, some things came up that she, you know, we couldn't have a babysitter, so she stayed home with my daughters. But I'm, I'm happily married. I've been in the ministry 12 years. The last seven years, I've been traveling all over. Last couple of years, I've been to uh, Mexico. I preached in Cuba. Uh, you know, I'm, I've been, God's been sending me places. So I encourage you tonight, let God heal you. When God heals you, he will send you. And I thank the Lord tonight that I'm saved. Uh, I just want to encourage you tonight that keep looking out to Jesus, the author and the finisher 
of your faith. Tonight, if you need a healing, if you need prayer, I'm going to ask the musicians to come back. And I just want to encourage you tonight. I hope the testimony, you know, what God did for me in my life encourages you. I want to leave that with you tonight. Those of you that are listening by radio or, 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 or on TV, we're still going live. I want to encourage you young people. God can set you free. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you young people tonight, you, you don't want to come into the house of God, I want to encourage you right where you are or even if you're going to get in trouble, it feels like your last hour, your last minute on the world, please call out to Jesus because Jesus will hear you he'll make a way he'll set you free the bible says there was a thief on the two thieves on the cross the one man said leave him alone the other thief made fun but the other man said remember me when thou was in paradise and, and i believe tonight that man went home to be with jesus so young people if you're on the last breath if you're on, a, on the last play, part of your life please call on Jesus. Uh, the meetings are here for the young people. Uh, young people, Jesus can deliver you of drugs, uh, um, uh, crystal meth, uh, fentanyl, marijuana, pornography, alcohol. Jesus Christ came to set the captives free. Tonight you just got to call on the name of the Lord. Uh, you shall be saved. Uh, hallelujah. I want to encourage everybody else here to please pray for the young people. If you ever see them around, uh, you know the best way to minister to young people over the years I learned uh, was just to listen to them uh, let them talk uh, whether they cursing uh, whether they're mad uh, the best way to win somebody is just to open your ears uh, hallelujah a lot of times I just listen to the people and they come and they tell me what they go through in life uh, I don't say a word uh, I just sit there in my mind I'm praying in the Holy Ghost uh, as they tell me all their problems and situations uh, at the end of them talking they rise up and they say Thank you for all your words. Thank you for comforting me. But meanwhile, I never said a word. It was the Holy Ghost that was comforting them. It was the Spirit of God, the love of God touching them. So I want to encourage people tonight. If you see young people this in, in, in troubles and trials, be the witness. Just listen to them. Let them talk. And when you're done, say a prayer. Amen. Just bless them in the name of Jesus. Tonight, if you, if you need prayer, please come up. If you need a healing, please come. Before we, uh, before we do one song, just hold on, brothers. Before we do one song, before we, we pray for the sick, I want to ask tonight, is there anybody here? Is there anybody here tonight that, that is backslidden? Is there anybody on TV, on the radio, or in this building? Maybe your heart is cold. Maybe you walked away from God. Maybe you're a backslider. Maybe you don't even know Jesus. But I'm asking the brothers to do a slow, soft song, a gospel worship. If there's anybody here that would like to give their life to Jesus, I will pray with you. Those of you on TV and on the radio, if you're listening, come on down. Come drive down to the arena here. We'll, we'll pray for you. I don't care if you're drunk or on drugs. Please come on down. We will pray for you. Or if there's anybody here tonight that wants to give your life back to the Lord, you're in the right place tonight. And those of you, I know there's people here tonight that are suffering from anxiety. There's people here tonight that are suffering from anxiety. Sometimes you feel like you're going funny. Sometimes you feel like you're, you're not all there in your mind. It just kind of comes and goes. It's anxiety. God wants to heal you tonight. If you feel in your mind that you're going to black out or something, God wants to heal you tonight. Like I said earlier, there's somebody here with pain in the heart. Down the arm, I felt it as I walked in. I felt it as I sat there. But there's somebody tonight needs a healing. But I want to leave it open tonight. If anybody here wants to give your life to the Lord tonight, tonight is your night. Let this be your night of giving your life to Jesus the Bible says we're not promised tomorrow my wife went to bed and she never woke up she never woke up January 25th she went to bed January 25th never woke up January 26th 27 years old with no problems in her health she never woke up the next day she opened her eyes in heaven 
A lot of us, we, we put everything off for tomorrow. Tomorrow, next week. But we're not promised next week. We're not promised tomorrow. Tonight, while you still have breath in you, the Bible says, as you hear the Holy Ghost, harden not your heart. Is there anybody tonight, before we, we pray for anybody, is there somebody that wants to say, I want to give my life to Jesus, would you please come? Please come, let this be your night. That you come and you make it right before the Lord. As you stand in the presence, the Lord will wash you, he'll cleanse you. The Lord is here to save you. He's here to give you an expected end. The Bible says in Jeremiah, I'll watch over my word. I'll hasten over my word. So the altar is open tonight. If anybody wants to give your life to the Lord, or if you need a healing, please come. God bless you.
I couldn't run, I couldn't run anymore. 
Amen. <clears throat> well, Pastor. the Lord for the word and you know I thank God for saving souls tonight amen, amen. Yes. and all praise the Lord <laughs> hallelujah Woo! We're, we're gonna ask him to come you know why don't you come guys just come come in front you know those three young men were there those young boys and your sister come don't be, don't be shy you yeah come the one I accepted the Lord those young men hallelujah thank you Jesus they may have stepped out I don't see them praise the Lord thank you Jesus can you come up quickly come we'll, we'll greet you in the name of the Lord hallelujah Thank you, Jesus. Maybe they went out. Praise the Lord. You know, you would not accept the Lord. Can you come in front for a few seconds, for a few minutes? We'll reach you. Asta. Are you still here tonight? Come and greet this young man. Let's all stand. Come and greet this young man. Hallelujah. Oh, there they are. Those Asta me. One of them is my grandson. Come here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. The, the stand with that man there and turn around. They'll, they'll greet you. They're going to shake your hand. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody. Just, just greet them in the Lord. Hallelujah. And that young lady over there, can you lift up your hand? Come on. Lift up your hand. Come on. That young woman accepted the Lord. Hallelujah. It's good, uh, you know, there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repented. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead, brother, sing a song. All that loves, all my sins are gone. I have long.
Praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen. Maybe I'm going to ask my wife if she wants to come. She doesn't feel good. Ask them. Come and say a few words. Amen. I'll give this mic to you. East end of this come. Hallelujah. Ask them. Come and glorify the Lord. Ask them. God has done so much for you. Ask them. And ask them. Praise the Lord. I just want to thank the Lord for this weekend services that we had. As a, I just want to thank the visitors that came to help to come have church with us from Moose Lake, Cross Lake, Easterville, Saskatchewan, Ontario, where nowhere else. <laughs> I thank the Lord for Isa, uh, for the souls that got saved tonight for this, these uh, meetings, couple of nights we had, and uh, Chris' uh, testimonies. Um, it's encouraging. He said that the lives out there, they got touched by his testimony. Yeah? 
Mr. Saibata Guska Gutsik Hard Life, I'll say Norway House. Well, I just thank the Lord for helping out people that are helping out uh, Kisa Christians keep on pressing on for Jesus, keep holding on for Jesus. We'll see him one day. Thank you, Jesus. I went through a lot, Nisa Isaiho. Jesus is the one that brought me back. I just want to sing a song. Um, for, I just want to sing, sing a song for... People said I never make it Never see it through They don't know what keeps me going Guess they have
of our ministry we said till death to us part in sickness and in health amen hallelujah but i thank god he's the healer even the other day i think it was friday i went to to the blind and and i went there my pulled the boat and all of a sudden i sat there i had bad chills and it didn't right through my body i couldn't get warm and I came home and I stayed in bed for a while and she said, I'll take you to the hospital. But it was full, but I got healed here. Hallelujah. You know, I said a fire went through here instantly, amen. I feel good. Hallelujah. And I ask my man to go see And many of you have been healed, even, even through the radio, eh? emotional issues. You know, people that are defeated in their mind tonight, God is restoring them. They think they can make it, but our testimony tonight really, really touched many. But you know, tonight we're, we're going to release you early. Can we stand? Can he point out? I'm going to ask the Lord what, whatever is being cooked there. But tomorrow, the Turner girls are going to cook some goose. We're going to eat at 4 o'clock. <laughs> No, your dad is going to cook it. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. They're going to cook three. If you want to come and eat, go at the church, four o'clock. Bring your own forks and plates. <laughs> Just kidding, there will be plates. <laughs> Let's all pray. Father, we can ask him it now. For every soul that you have touched. Lord, you paid a price, Father. And today, Lord, there's a cost of it. Lord, that, that sacrificed many have given to you, Lord, to preach the gospel. Many that have that left home, left, left jobs, and to serve you, Lord. And we give you glory for that, Father. And Lord, according to your word, that there will be a hundredfold, Lord, in return. Lord Jesus, begin to bless them that have come through the miles, Lord, through the trials that they've gone through because of coming here. But Lord, bless them, Lord. So when they make, Lord, restore them, heal them, let the fresh oil fall upon them. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost, Lord, awesome in so many me. And tonight, Lord, we pray for Darlene, Lord, Bradburn tonight, and his children, Lord, that you would give them comfort, Lord, that they let their, his wife, his, his husband, I mean, Lord, to lay him to rest. But Lord, in ask him, not man, the opportunity that I've known Thomas, Lord, Lord, I believe he touched many hearts through singing. But tonight, Lord, we just give you glory for everything. The visitors that are here, Lord, so many me. Lift them up, Lord, that they will not be tired spiritually, physically, and mentally, Lord. Lord, that fresh oil to begin to do a work in them, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for this night in Jesus' name. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. And everybody Amen. said, Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Sin no more. Amen. We'll, we'll, we'll sing one while you eat. Bless 